and welcome to the Uniweb Interview Show. You know me, of course, as your host, Matthew Whiteside, the always affable. I'm here today with my friend Joel Byers, comedian, author, podcaster, reunited poltergeist. Yes. Joel, thanks so much for coming on, man. This is awesome. Dude, I'm so excited. Thanks for having me. Like, we were talking before we started recording how how weird it was that we met or again yeah it's this is definitely fate this is fate happening right in front of you we went to college didn't even really know each other yeah. as like friends or whatever we we're both on the football team right and that's about as far as we got because i think the year you started playing was my junior year and that was the year i quit oh that's the year i started quitting in life <laughs> <laughs> Not just football, folks. I just gave up on a lot of things. But you graduated? I graduated. There we go. Yeah, I, did, I finished college. Uh-huh. Yeah, I just quit, you know, breaking myself in half. Dude. Yeah, well, the, I mean, coaches, you know. Coach Iruli. Yeah, dude. Did you see him on, um, he was on Last Chance U. No. He was, but it was like a, he was recruiting up in East K. And like, there was just a shot of him. And you know how he stands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There was just a shot of Coach Iruli. And I was like, no way. It's amazing. It is his big break. It was his big break, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, football, I mean, it, it's a great learning experience. You learn a lot about mindset and about, uh, well, clearly, I was going to say finish what you start. Clearly, Matt didn't learn that. But just you learn about, a lot about how to communicate, teamwork, work ethic, and things like that. But it is, you know, a, a lot of the times, just like in everything we do, kind of your, your coach or your teacher and kind of determine what lessons you learn and what you actually get out of it. Yeah. You know, my, some of my favorite teachers were the hardest just because they forced me to challenge myself and to be held accountable. Yeah. So the same thing goes like with your coaches, you know, some are just a little more destructive, some are more constructive. Some like to cuss at you until you die. Like, <laughs> yeah. go roll. The roll. And I, I want to get into this too because sorry, yeah, we don't. Talk you're, about no, it's it's great because I think that was some of the not the first time, but like some of the funniest things ever came out of the misery of football. Yeah, like I don't know if the, and for everyone who doesn't know, so let's talk about this first. We can get back to this, but Joel has been doing comedy for almost ten years now. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh, right after college, you said f this degree. <laughs> yeah, it was really second semester senior year. Okay, I tried it. And that was it, you know. Where like, did you try it? It was a place called Side Splitters. It was me and about seven people. Five of them worked at the club, so I don't know why they're closed now. But <laughs> yeah. it, it was literally like I just did an open mic, and I didn't kill, but people politely smiled, yes, and nice. I was like, "Oh, okay, <laughs> this just I, I can do this." And then you know, the next ten years of stumbling, but. I knew as soon as I did it, that's exactly what I was born to do. It was huh. one of those things in the back of my mind that always, like I remember being asked in high school, if you could do anything, what would it be? And I was like, stand-up comedy. But, uh, but that's not realistic. And then senior year of college, you're like, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, I might as well try this thing that's been itching my brain for the past 21 years. Right. And as soon as I did it, if it wasn't so close to graduation, I would have dropped out and been like, no, this is it. Wow. You hear stories of comedians all the time. Yeah. Like Brian Regan famously dropped out the week of his graduation. So it's like it's, it's he like, looks like the type to do something. It's like, like the that. comedian mindset to where like as soon as you start it, you're like, oh, this is everything now. Yeah, it's been my everything. And you, you all realize because I literally just started on Tuesday. Yeah. this past Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. but it's been a dream of mine. And as soon well, as as soon as I did it, I thought I will do any other part time job to pay to do this for the rest of my life. Oh my gosh, I'm about to cry. Like, you know, but, that feeling. Yeah, that's yeah. it's amazing, right? Oh my gosh, so liberating. And even if even if I didn't do great, it's just like I sucked at it, obviously. Like it wasn't great, but you get that, oh my god, this is it. This is what I was looking for forever. You didn't suck at it either. I was actually luckily I was luckily there. I'm so glad I was there for that. Too. That was weird too. I didn't know you were going to be there. It was really just uh, it was just fade again, I don't yeah. know. But it really it really just breaks down you got on stage regardless of the outcome. I respect anyone that 
like 99% of people in the world are too scared to even do what you did on Tuesday. Yeah. So regardless of the outcome, you standing there is a victory. And on top of that, you did get laughs. And there were more people at your first time than mine, I would say. Except mine was at a comedy club. Yours was at a coffee have, shop with the, with, with the sun still shining through the back of the window. You know what's strange? I have a lot of people at both of my first times. And oh, you, really? you know that. That was one of the jokes. My first time having sex, there was... Oh, dude. <laughs> Wait, that's true? That's a true story. Oh, dude. It wasn't like... But it was different. That wasn't... <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll explain that story more to you later. Those who don't know, don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it. It clearly wasn't funny if I don't worry Thank about you. It. No. Thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to know more about your journey, man, because stand-up, so many people wash out because it is... I mean, you get up there and a lot of us pour our hearts out on stage. And even if we don't, if nobody responds or laughs or they do, they boo, it's hard to be funny. Like, a lot of people have been funny their whole life, but being professionally funny, like, be funny, mm-hmm. that is, like, a totally different game. What have the past 10 years been like for you? Well, it's kind of like you said with, uh, with like, football. Some of the funniest things come out of the worst things. Yeah. You know, same thing with life. And as a comedian, you look to convert those terrible things into the funny things. Right. But it is all a process, and... If you want to understand the comedy hustle, you can look at comedy as a language, and the only way to exercise that language is being on stage. Right. You can do it from the mirror, you can do it in front of your Furbies, but until you get in front of a room, <laughs> even if it's literally like we did in the writing club where it's like five people in a room, yeah. any, it, I've done shows with one person. It's all productive, just standing on a stage looking down at a stranger or yeah. a group of people and trying to evoke a laugh based on your thoughts. That's almost more difficult. I've like I've only done it now four times mm-hmm. total. It's almost it's been more difficult the less amount of people are there. Oh yeah. Oh it's yeah, like, yeah what that's the my hell? favorite to watch. Like yeah. that's why I mean I just interviewed a comedian this weekend and his Thursday show had like twenty five people. Yeah. And I love he's a professional, twenty five years, international headliner. But I love watching professionals perform in those environments because that's when you really, that's when you really have to become a comedian and really pull out all the stops and the tricks to engage an audience and yeah. to sustain their attention and take them on an entertaining journey for an hour. Yeah, it's it's if you can perform in front of two people, as if it were two thousand. When you get in front of two thousand, it's autopilot. Right. It's a different game. It's kind of like I look at those small crowds as like deadlifts. Where it's just like the work you just got it, yeah. you got to do, and it pays off in the long run. But at the time you're just grunting and just like rah, rah. But the more you do it, the stronger you get. Yeah. And it's kind of like it. I like the show we did. I try to treat those shows like like it is like a comedy club packed out and right. perform and project <laughs> and be almost like bigger than the room, and then doing those reps and it takes time. It's something that took me years to even become mindful of, mm-hmm. but I'm st- I'm still honing it. But you mean like acting out all the stuff and just yeah. and just delivering a joke as if it is like 500 people instead of just like five. Yeah, you know, and really giving those five people the same show you would give 500. Right. That is really that is really half the battle to become a comedian is just being able to turn it on in front of any audience, anytime, yeah, any place. Yeah. You talk about this on your podcast, Hot Breath. Hot Breath. Which is fantastic podcast, by the way. It's on YouTube, Hot Breath mm-hmm. Pod, and on Apple iTunes and yep. stuff. Um, really good stuff. We talk about performing when you don't feel like it. And how... I mean, I, I can only speak for myself, but there are so many times... I've done a ton of interviews, and there are times where I'm just like, I'm so tired. I don't mm-hmm. want to be up. Yeah. And I can imagine going up on stage, like, what do you do when you're just exhausted and you have to get up there and be funny. I mean, it's part of the job. It's part of what you signed up for. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone has a bad day at work or not everyone always feels like going to work. But, you know, I just, I was like, I had like the flu or something and then had to headline a show in Charlotte and I just like did the show. And before the show, I just focused on just how grateful I was to even 
being having this problem to begin with. It's like, oh, I'm yeah. sick and I don't want to do this, but I'm so grateful that I even get Good to team. be sick and have to do this. Yeah. Like, I'm standing backstage about to go out and headline this almost sold out show, and it, I think gratitude helps you to really put it in perspective that like, yeah, everyone has bad days or whatever, but hey, I get to be a comedian. I get, my dream is my job. Yeah. And it's like, it, I mean, it's like being a writer and showing up when you don't feel like it and writing, you know, writing as a sitting muscle. Sitting down, yeah. Sitting down mm-hmm. and showing up. I One of my favorite quotes, um, it may have been, um, may have been George Carlin where he's like, I hate writing, but I love having written. Yeah. You know, it's like you, you showed up and you did the work and is that that's what I kind of pride myself on is especially starting out with comedy my my advice for every comedian is to live on stage yeah any anywhere anytime I don't know if two in the morning in front of two people like have the discipline respect the craft show up anywhere and just live I lived on stage and if I if I wasn't performing I was watching I was out at comedy clubs on weekends watching headliners Mm. just absorbing everything I could on learning comedy which is now what is ironically synthesized into my podcast where it's me interviewing comedians just about how they got to where they are and what is their process it's like that's how I started it's just absorbing consuming everything comedy which is another amazing uh, commonality that you're do- you're doing that mm-hmm. while I was doing this as well uh, between us both but because there's such a collaborative like I was uh, talking to another person earlier about how this feeling of lack and like we have to step on one another to get somewhere mm-hmm. where I believe that is absolutely not the case at all. Agreed. Like we get better by sharpening one another. by Because there's plenty of funny to go around. You're either funny or you're not funny. <laughs> right? And like people will laugh at it if it's good. If it's not good, then you don't have a career. So just get better at it. Just focus on getting funny. Like, yeah. It, I had I did a I did a a Q and A on uh, my Instagram and Facebook today, and and someone posted a question about how do you become a regular at a comedy club, and then I asked how long they've been doing it, and it was four months, mm. and I was like, dude, <laughs> you need to worry about how can I be funny first. Yeah. Four months, yeah. dude. I didn't even think about like how can I get paid literally until like six years in when I was like, Oh, I have a product worth selling now. Right. It was literally like six years before I was like, all right, let's start getting paid. That's a great point too. Like you, it, because it, it is a product. It's yes. something that you have taken time to develop and now package into mm-hmm. here it is. I guarantee <laughs> that you will yeah. laugh. Yeah, These are time tested and proven jokes. You can be seen too soon, but you can never be seen too late. And the, a big thing in this game is like the rebook. So you mm-hmm. may get that opportunity once to perform at that sold out show, but if it doesn't go well, they're not going to call you back. Maybe the CEO in the audience that needs a comedian for their holiday party won't be calling you to do that. Right. It's like you just focus on getting funny first. Get good and your opportunities will come from that. Now you've done a lot of different types of shows. Mm-hmm. I mean, all over the place. Like from dirty to clean, because there's a lot in, in between, right? I mean, um, when we talk about like dirty comics, like people who are doing stand up at like 2 a.m. in a club to being able to perform at like a church. Yeah. Because it's all work, it's all doing stand up. There's mm-hmm. not, not a difference in terms of, you know, the actual craft of it. Do you have a preference in what you do? I feel like I know, but. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, my preference is just I like to be funny but when I started and I think it's important for comedians to set their standard up front as well is like my my goal was to always be universal my Mm. goal was to be able to do the same jokes I do in a church that I do at a strip club that I do at like a college yeah I want to make sure my jokes work in all of those environments right so I like starting out I did a lot of what they call urban shows which means I'm just like the only white person in the area code. <laughs> yeah. And because that's where a lot of my opportunities came from. Yeah. And and I would notice like if I did a joke there that didn't work in maybe a primarily white room, I would get rid of the joke. Or if I did a joke in a white room that didn't primarily work in the black room, I would get rid of the joke. But mm-hmm. the jokes I found that worked in both, 
was like, oh, I'm on to something here when it's working kind of everywhere. Right. But I've always wanted to be clean and like universal and make as many people laugh as possible. Right. So I have done strip clubs at 1 a.m. I have done churches at lunch. You know, I have done a corporate gig for like their um, potluck or whatever. Yeah. Like I've performed everywhere and I want to make sure that my jokes work in every single environment. Because it really is just about making as many people laugh as possible. For me personally, right. I wanted to impact and connect with as many people as possible, and right. I knew to do that, my jokes would need to be universal. Now, that doesn't mean that I do hack material. What, what's crazy about comedy is like the more personal, the more universal. Yeah. So that's why I, I complimented you on how personal your material already is just a week into it, because mm-hmm. it took me years to understand, oh, I need to be more introspective. And when I actually talk about me as like the filter, if I filter everything through me and my point of view and my experience with whatever I'm talking about, it connects with the audience more. And that's when you start to have people coming up after the show and being like, oh, that's just like my uncle or, oh, my Mm -hmm. mom said that to me when I was growing up. When you start to create the memorable material as opposed to we've all seen a comedian who's like, man, they were funny and you don't remember anything they said. Yeah. That the personal is what's going to be memorable. Yeah, because you can. Yeah, you can be funny but not connect. Oh, yeah, 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 for yeah. sure. That connection is what brings people back. Right, and that's and that's about getting rebooked too. Mm-hmm. Because if they remember your material, they connected with them, they're more likely to be like, oh, let's bring that Joel back. Exactly. Um, now you do your you do your podcast. How long have you been doing the Hot Breath for? Almost four years. Four years. Yeah. How did how did that? Well, we know how it came about, but I mean, how did you find your first guest? Was it like somebody you were, you just met at the at the club working with, or? It was actually my friend Rob Hayes, okay. who um, we started together, pretty much started together back in the day in Atlanta. I mean, we were we were young in the game together, back in 2010 when we were both here, and um, I mean, he's since gone on to be on Comedy Central and like Jimmy Fallon and like he, I mean, he's. He's one of those cats that moved to New York yeah. and just just did it. Like, like lived it. in like a two bedroom with four dudes. Like just just <laughs> did it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. Like when you hear about people moving to LA and living on couches and just finding a way. Like he was here for a while, several years. Got really funny and then moved to New York and is like I'm doing it. And he actually did it. It's it's um. So he's done my first episode and he's done my hundredth episode as well oh, wow. and I'm th- I'll have him on for 200 again but he uh, he was just a friend and I was like I'm starting this podcast and really the podcast started because I love Atlanta comedy mm-hmm. and then I, I noticed on uh, last comic standing on NBC there were 10 comics from Atlanta like in the f- semifinals wow and I was like this is crazy and then I was like, I should interview all those comics yeah. just to have it as like a time capsule. So Rob was one of those comics. So I was like, well, let's start with Rob. I'm coolest with him. So then from there, I, I just threw some I was friends with, some it was referrals, yeah. some I went through management. But I was able to hammer down all ended up being 11 because I learned the winner from the previous year was also from Atlanta. Wow. So I ended up getting those 11 people as like a time capsule of Atlanta comedy. Mm. And uh, Rob really was the first of that. Now you talk about Atlanta being, um, I feel like it's a hotbed now mm-hmm. for entertainment, comedy, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and you talk about Rob moving off to New York. Like, do you see that as a, a need to do thing now for, for comics starting out? Or like, do you think people can grow a huge career in Atlanta as their, you know what I mean? Like you said, oh, yeah. Rob went off to, I'm going to do the thing, go to the cellar and all these different places and and make a career for myself but you can do that here in Atlanta agreed and that's that's part of my mission is to show comics that it is possible from anywhere yeah there's a comedian I've interviewed named uh, Dusty Slay mm-hmm. who um, living in Nashville he's yeah. been on Fallon he's been on Jimmy Kimmel wow. he was just on Variety's Top 10 Comics to Watch wow. all from uh, living in Nashville yeah so it is possible now more than ever right for me personally part of my journey and my vision was to do everything from Atlanta, not have to move yeah. and like and build it there, but to actually build it and they will come 
almost. Yeah. So yeah, I don't. They'll seek you out. Yes. Kind of deal. You you like you build a big enough planet, and the gravity will bring in <laughs> yeah. all the people. All that the meteors to destroy you. Well, you know. <laughs> but I don't. I don't. Um, I don't dishearten or discourage people from moving to New York or LA yeah. if they want. If that want if that's part of you know their journey. And uh, for me personally, I set my standards and my expectations and my goals up front, and those have kind of been, you know, kind of like my roadmap and all the decisions I made. Yeah. What are your goals moving forward? I mean, ten years in comedy, you've had success. You, you're, uh, I mean, you get paid to do stand up now. It's, it's your career. It's your mm-hmm. job. What are some goals for you moving forward? Like, what do you see your life being in stand up? Well, Hot Breath is a comedy education platform so it's only going to grow beyond the podcast but into actual like curriculum and also really a community almost like a town square for comedians and fans to connect directly yeah because what i've learned from doing the podcast is i can ask the nerdiest question about this joke a comic did on conan and like how did you write that and what was the evolution that i want to know and then I'm like, oh, it turns out thousands of other people want to know that too. And right. some aren't even comedians. Like, the impact that... I, I've literally had people from Ireland this week... Re- I had someone from Ireland and someone from uh, the UK reach out to me just this week saying how the podcast has helped them. One of them mm. has said it inspired me to start... I've had several people reach wow. out saying the podcast inspired them to start comedy. So I only want to um, broaden that impact yeah. and really build Hot Breath into like this educational platform that makes comedy accessible to everyone, really. Right. And uh, from the Joel Byers, specifically like my stand-up, my big goal right now is to, um, one, uh, shoot a special, mm-hmm. but also I mean, I'd like to get into acting. Yeah. And I've been writing down that I'm going to be um, acting in a Kevin Hart movie. I've been writing it down. Absolutely. I, I, this year, I'm like, hey, try everything else. Might as well just try writing down the craziest thing you can think of and see yeah, what happens. Man. So, another one is um, also recording an album in uh, Spanish. I want to record a Spanish album, a comedy album. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, I didn't know you were a singer. I'm going to do the Macarena <laughs> remix. So, it's like, beautiful. I'm, and I'm you not, know Spanish? I'm not fluent in it yet. I've, I've, done um, tree removal and I've done dishwashing and Perfect. landscaping so I, I've learned it I've learned it roughly but I, I one of my comedian friends I just recently discovered as I started putting this into the universe that I want yeah. to record um, a comedy album in Spanish and I was like well I need to get fluent I end up doing a show on a weekend the host is my comedian friend who is actually fluent natively in Spanish and wow. I was like oh perfect so now I'm scheduling weekly, like at least phone calls with him to start exercising that language. Wow. So yeah, it's amazing how people show up in our lives when we decide to move in a direction. Yeah, it's incredible how it happens. It, it when you start looking for it, you find it. It's crazy. Yeah. That's I mean I um I made the joke the other day that uh there's a saying when the when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, and it's not because there's some traveling band of you know teachers, mystic teachers that are like. Is he- <laughs> You ready? <laughs> just waiting. Yeah. Just waiting to jump out. Mm-hmm. It's because we're all like teachers for one another. Mm-hmm. It's just, am I willing to see it? Am I willing to be open to what you have to teach me? Or am I ready for it? You know? And that's such a cool thing when you think about it that way because you never come from a place of lack. There's never not the resource that you need. It's always available to you. Mm-hmm. You know, as long as you're willing to go out and see it. And being grateful for whatever happens. Yeah. Having, not really even having expectations. Right. Just being grateful for the process. Is the speaking of expectations, I can see that as being because like starting out, just being real honest here, I've come up with so many different opening liners, like the one I tried tonight, that I'm like, that is hilarious. It'll not it'll make people laugh because it's funny. Um, and my expectation immediately gets shattered when I try it. Oh yeah. <laughs> how do you how do you manage expectations about getting on stage? Because, you know, when you have something in your head, and you, I, because I imagine the whole thing, and I'm like, this is going to kill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the whole way, you're like, I'm going to get them with yeah. this one. They're, and then, like, I don't care if everything else sucks, that's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> and what's funny, you'll learn as you do this more that, like, 
you'll have something killer and you'll be on stage in the middle of saying it and you're like, this is not killer. <laughs> this is not killer. You haven't even finished the sentence yet and you're like, this was not it. <laughs> I mean, the, the stage is like the ultimate justice. Yeah. It's like, I mean, it's binary. It's like funny or no. You yeah. know, it's like, do you get a laugh or not? Um, I'm better at managing expectations now in terms of like, all right, this is one show out of the however many I'll do this month. Right. This is just, especially like the open mics that we saw each other at yeah. this week. In, any of that, I'm like, none of this could work. I'm fine. I'm getting reps right now. Yeah. But I'm saying it out loud because I understand the process that you can say it in front of the mirror all day, but you got to say it in front of a room of people. Right. So it's, you get better at dealing with it. But understand also that you're not alone in, I've heard Jerry Seinfeld say, not on hot breath yet, but I've heard him say, soon. yet. Soon. Yet. But you'll, be a, you'll be on his show, uh, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Oh, that would be great. That will be with great. Joe Flyers, yeah. That will be great. I'll be wearing a shirt, too. He'll, he'll be in one of those Fiat's. <laughs> <laughs> he'll for sure, yeah. He always picks cars. And what's funny, I'm like built like Gumby, so it's like, my torso is normal height, yeah. but then my legs just kept growing. Right. So like right now I look normal height, and then I stand up, and like only so, my knees would be in the frame. Yeah. Yeah. I well, to like complete opposite. Unfold. I tried to sit like you, and I, I, <laughs> I immediately wanted to comment on. It. I was like, this chair is not. It's not the right size. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so like, he, I mean, he even said like he's been doing it over thirty years. But when he does a new joke on stage, he's yeah. like an open micer again. Yeah. He has no idea if the checks are going to work or not. Yeah. So just take that. He's one of the best to ever do it. And mm-hmm. even he says that. And I've interviewed comics 20 years in the game who are like literally like one out of maybe 20 jokes I try, I end up keeping. Wow. So the, the success rate is very low for a joke. Like if I'm, I mean, just to let you know, like yeah. it's a lot. That's why you live on stage. So I've been writing pretty nonstop. Like I haven't performed the same joke twice, mm. which is incredible since I've been on stage four times. This guy's a natural. But what I'm saying, my question what I'm is, is, I am. What I'm saying is, I know. <laughs> <laughs> my question is though, like, would you suggest to like just chill with all the writing and like try to hammer down as much as I can with what I have? Because I feel like, I feel like ideas just come organically throughout mm-hmm. the day, and then I want to try it immediately. But then I, I I don't have anything that really works. Like I'll have like one joke maybe that hits kind of, and then I've got the rest. You know, the rest of the time is just absolute nothing. Right? Yeah, I I, like I. How do you build your sets? Is I guess the question. Yeah, it's it is a lot of trial and error and throwing out a bunch of jokes and then the ones that work you just keep. Yeah. And you can start to build on them from there. So like you may talk for five minutes on stage, you get one laugh, you're like, Oh I got a laugh. Okay, cool. Let me put this one over here and maybe I can do some writing around this. Or it's like I have this joke that works, let me do another five minutes. Oh I found two laughs here. Alright, let me bring these over here. Yeah. And you just start to piece it together. Okay. But I recommend, especially for someone like you who who is just like creatively charged and is like I just have so many ideas get them all out yeah the material you're doing now you're not going to be doing in a year like right. you just keep evolving as a comedian and yeah. you just keep the jokes I did early on were just silly I was gonna ask do you yeah. remember one of your first do you like remember your first joke I, I did one liners early on okay. literally like my one of the first jokes maybe my first joke I ever did on stage was um I had just I had just gone to a WWE event, and I was like, "Dude, yo, this is the only one I've been to, but those things are crazy." Yeah. But it was it was in Knoxville, and I just gone I just gone to it with some friends, and I remember like the thing with like jokes was like the the misdirect. I remember reading a book, and they're like the setup punch. You gotta set them up thinking one way, and then the punchline breaks their breaks their train of thought. Yeah. So the punch is like it's the surprise. So. I was like, I'm gonna get him with this. And I was like, man, I, college is crazy. We party all the time. I was at this party this week. There were flashing lights and uh, dudes in Speedos and music playing. And then I realized I was at a WWE event. <laughs> and that was the joke. 
then the whole thing is like I'm setting him up to think I'm at a party, but I'm really at a wrestling a event. wrestling match. I mean, <laughs> but the intention was there. Sure, I intended to do the misdirect, <laughs> which is the the mechanics of a joke. But yeah, it's not great. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think, but I think it's so important for anybody starting out, um, and this is true for writing too. What we wrote and what we said when we were very like very first starting out is so much different than what like because from my first book to my third book I'm like I don't even know who that was that wrote that book yeah you know yeah same thing with stand up and I think it's so important to be like don't worry about what you say right now as so much like try to be as funny as possible for sure like give it a great effort but don't be so hard on yourself yeah right because I think for me I, I would get in that mindset all the time like you're an absolute idiot. You can't tell a joke. Don't ever try again. You know what I mean? Like, beat myself into the sit-down showers kind of deal. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a callback to a joke. I'll like, never. <laughs> and like, Be funny. And it's it's a process. And, like, I'm telling you, man, when I started out, if, um, if my first joke, almost if, like, my first breath didn't get a laugh, I'd be like, well, this set's a waste. And I would, like, turn around and start rubbing the wall. <laughs> And like, hey, I would bail immediately. Like, if my first joke didn't get a laugh, I'm like, well, this, this set's done. Because isn't it just like, uh, and I always, I've been using this, it's like what Mike Tyson said. You're, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Not getting a laugh immediately is like getting punched in the friggin' face. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when the expectation is, this is going to be great. Oh, and you go, oh. Yeah. It's like, home run. And like, strike three. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, there's, a, there's a comedian here in Atlanta who has a joke about, it, like, a comedian bombing. And it's like, um, every joke that misses, he gets smaller and smaller on stage. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so, it, LeVar Walker, he's, he's been on the podcast a couple times. But that's, that's one of my favorite. And that's like a saver, though. Yeah. So like you'll learn that as you do it, um, like a saver joke, he will use that joke if like if he does a couple jokes that don't work, then he'll do that as a saver to then make fun of how the joke didn't work, and then he goes into an act out and he gets a laugh. Just yeah. like when I was rubbing the wall, I eventually turned that into a joke. Yeah, I can where see it would be be like, oh, this is my favorite joke. I call it ecstasy. Or whatever. <laughs> and I'd be rubbing the wall, and then yeah. I started like spanking the wall and be like, oh, you must work out like harder, you know? So. That evolved into almost a saver, in a nice. sense. And you just learn from just survival. Yeah. But writing, one of my favorite quotes about writing is that like writing is a muscle. Yeah. And the more you do it, the stronger it gets. Same thing with stand-up. The more you do it, the better it'll get. Because there has to be a natural ease to a person on stage, right? I mean, I, does it have to be? Yeah. That's my, I, I, that's my preferable. Like, I like when I see somebody who looks so comfortable. And it's just like, come on, bud. Like, let's yeah. have fun together. And you can you can look at a comedian as like a musician, and they're like everyone's playing a different song. Right. So someone may like Sinatra, another person may like Slayer. You know, like, <laughs> and it's, it's quite com- <laughs> comedy can be like as personal as like a food preference. So right. some people are like, oh, Kevin Hart's hilarious. Some people are like, Kevin Hart's terrible. Like, you hear that all the time. Like successful comedians still have people that don't like them just because comedy is like a personal preference so yeah it's a taste yeah um hold on a second this always yeah. I'm so weird about this but I always feel like it's not I don't know why I know I can, I'm like it's a recording I know I wish there was a way <laughs> there needs to be a light to like um a light on you think it'd be nice if there was a light or like something to reflect because I'll do that too when I record because I'll have my camera and I'll flip out the screen towards me Oh yeah. But I'll I'll constantly I'll be like checking every now and then and checking the the recorder as well. Make like, sure it's going. Yeah. <laughs> it's but, like a son of a bitch. Oh, hey, let's do all that again. I've, dude, I've I've lost interviews. And really? I, oh, dude, yeah, I've I've lost interviews. I um I lost one. His name's Ron G. And, um, he like plays the dad, but he's very successful comic from Atlanta now out in L.A. And I interviewed him. Um, he, while he was visiting in Atlanta, yeah. lost the interview, and was like, oh, maybe I should just go to L.A. and um, do it out there. And then I went out there, and first time out to L.A., and like just parlay into a whole experience. But, wow. dude, you want to talk about failure. 
just like how you start out being terrible. Podcasting, I did one phone interview. Um, the the recorder batteries died, and then the SD card filled up. Oh, it, it just kept snowballing. Luckily, Jeez. luckily it was my friend Noah Garden Schwartz. I don't know if I should keep just telling these people's credits, but like, just everyone on this podcast is dope. I mean, yeah, they but, really are. I was that was gonna be my next question for you. Is what? Is it dope? No, no, no. Uh, not, <laughs> I know it's a great podcast, but have you ever been like? I can't believe I'm having a conversation with this person. Bo Burnham was probably the first. Dude. Because he, he's amazing. The guy's incredible. What was incredible about it is that his people reached out to me. Like... He must have been like... I, like when I got the email, <laughs> I was just like, this is not real. Yeah. This is not real. But he, he was in town uh, promoting his movie, Eighth Grade. Yeah. And um, they're like, would you be willing to have Bo come on and talk about the movie? And I was just like, this is not real. And they were saying, like, we have a screening time here for you to see it. And like... Just like, oh, and I responded timidly, like, yeah, just any more details. And I'm sure we can schedule a time, just feeling it out. And yeah. then they sent back like a like a PDF, and we're like, oh, and I was like, oh, Bo Burnham's people just reached out to me about doing my podcast. Like a press kit and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like it was, that was, I was super prepared. I prepare for all my interviews, like, oh. I like, don't. <laughs> so intensely. Like, I research these people from day one. Like, I want to be able I want to be asking questions where they're like, wait, how did you, how do you know that? <laughs> I love it's doing It's amazing, it. yeah. Well, my goal with each interview is for people to listen to this interview and yeah. know they got everything. Yeah. Like, I synthesize all of the information out there about them into, like, one discussion. Yeah. So, Bo Burnham was probably the first person I'm like, whoa. Yeah. He's sitting here, and it's because he wanted to be here. Yeah. So... But it wasn't like starstruck or like, like oh, how am I going to do this? Like, it was further, long enough into my podcasting career where I was like, I know I'm prepared. Right. I know this is going to go well. But it was still like, oh, he showed up. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, he's <laughs> like here. Like, they were just messing with you? Yeah, right? Yeah, like, because I don't get excited until, like, after it right. happens, you know, about anything anymore. So, when... That in the middle of that interview, I am like, okay, we're on to something here because yeah. he's sitting here doing it. He's probably the first one where I was like, all right, that's a new level. Yeah, and because he, he's like immensely talented, it's not just stand up, but as an artist, like yeah. producer, director, the way he created his own shows is like something to behold. Like, what do you say? It took like three years to create. Uh, stand-up show. He was like 16 when he was yeah, doing it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, he's like, he's a virtuoso. I mean, he's right. really a prodigy. He's still only like, he's, I mean, 27. he's 20s. Yeah. yeah. So it's like... Younger than both of us. So, I mean, it's it's uh, it's inspiring to be around those people, which is yeah. why I like doing the podcast, which I'm sure you as well, is being around like-minded people. Right. You know, that that's why I like doing the writing club, because it's getting comedians in the same room that are actually motivated by like they want to do something with comedy you're not a, like you said you were at the open mic half the half the cats up there just wasting time yeah not even knowing what they want to talk about like somebody actually did somebody like the person before theirs at the whole set yeah it's it it's, it's just like what are you doing it doesn't make any sense like and that's <laughs> open that's open mic environment sure. so it's like the writing club gives comics an opportunity to like be in a productive environment yeah. where I'm around I'm network it's as much like performing and writing as it is like networking and being like oh you take this seriously too Yeah, we should stay in touch yeah I think that's so important in, in terms of like just sticking with the winners yes because it's so easy to just nav- I was going to ask you this too because I'm, I don't drink anymore uh, I'm so open about everything because I have had my whole journey about not drinking I've recorded it all and everybody knows about it on the podcast. <laughs> like, you know, almost almost a year sober. But like getting into thank you, thank you. Bravo. Getting into comedy, um, thinking about like hanging out at comedy clubs till late at night, being in that environment, um, but wanting to wanting to be in that environment because that's like where the comedy is and loving that environment, but not wanting to get stuck in the we're just getting hammered drunk and being stupid on stage, like differentiating the groups. You know, and and I don't feel like you're somebody who stays out super late doing that kind of thing. I don't know for sure. I'm just generalizing completely. I, I'm so focused. You're right. I don't. Even, I rarely drink anymore. Yeah. So are you cre- Are you creating the groups? Like, are you finding people who are also? Because I feel like it's a big movement, and stand up 
also to like people getting sober, people not getting messed up and drunk and using drugs and like it used to be in the eighties and stuff like that, early nineties everyone was just getting uh, yeah tore apart. Part of the culture, yeah. Part of the culture. Mm-hmm. It's not as much anymore. That's interesting. that's an interesting observation. I honestly haven't paid that much attention to it. I mean, there's always gonna be people that do. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, like I guess you hear in the eighties like people were just get yeah, because you would hear in like the eighties people would get like paid in cocaine. Like, yeah. You've heard of that. Yeah. And, like it's um so it's definitely not that integrated. I mean, it's it is like a viable job. You know, like it's right. like a professional endeavor people can embark on. Yeah. So it is one of those things you kinda you get out what you put in. Right. And there are several stories of comics who were drunks and as soon as I got sober, oh now they're everywhere. Yeah. So it's um Well like Mulaney, John Mulaney oh, yeah. talks about doing it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. I I personally it it, it can be a toxic environment. And some comedians become alcoholics because they are out in these bars every night. Right. And they do get in that environment. And they're like, well, let's have a drink before I go on stage. And then a drink turns into a keg, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like... <laughs> this is exactly how it works for me. <laughs> That's how I drink. So, I mean, it's pretty much at the end of the day, like, surrounding yourself with a, a positive and supportive environment. Yeah. That if you do go to that bar show, it's like making sure there's some accountability with you. Yeah. To just not even fall into that temptation well so when you when you were first starting out like who would you cling on to like would you go out actively and like because I, I noticed that the open mics I was like hey how's it going my name like introduced and they're all like what are you, get yeah. away from me yeah yeah <laughs> you yeah. Know? you're new you know you're yeah. new you're, they're feeling you out they want to make sure you stick with it or that they want to make sure you're funny yeah you know I would cling to the funny people right. like I would always grab like, like the Rob Hayes Mm-hmm. Um, Dulce Sloan started here. She's now on uh, Daily Show. Yeah. Uh, like I would, I would always just gravitate towards the funny people that just had that spark, had something that intrigued me. They had a certain style or a certain delivery or a certain writing. Kind of, they were able to tr- like say crazy things, but it came off as like grounded. Like yeah. I, I like I like I said, I would have I would study everything. Yeah. So like. Even open mics, I would just sit there and I would just study every comedian. A lot of comedians, and this is um, something Lunell recently said on my podcast. I feel like I'm plugging my podcast. Dude, but I'm not this meaning, is you, bro. But I'm literally not meaning to plug the podcast. I'm yeah. literally just saying I talked to this person. It's and they so said that, good, though. Like, hot breath is so good. I need to figure out a way to say those things different. Because I don't want to be like, my podcast my podcast. But a lot of the things I've learned are from experience or from just talking to all these different comedians. So Linnell recently said that a big mistake comics are making now is that they're not studying the craft. They're not sitting at a show studying the headliner. They're not sitting, like when I was at an open mic, I'm not really there um, hanging out on the patio or whatever. Like I'm at the show working through my set list and like studying comics and what are they doing? What do I like? that they're doing or what what are they doing that I don't like what can I learn mm-hmm. from them good or bad yeah so I would study every comic so the ones that really stuck out to me I would like I would take the time to go up to them and be like hey I like I like that joke you did about um about you know your dog how did you come up with that is that true like a great a great way to just kind of start a conversation with a comedian is to like compliment them Right. We like we like laughter. We like compliments. We like affirmation. So yeah. if you're like, I really like that joke you did. Like how how like how long you been doing it? Yeah. Like is it true? How'd you come up with it? And just enter it from that sense, and then you start speaking comedian. Yeah. You know, you hear Jerry Seinfeld talk. He likes talking comedians the most, just because it's like a, it's a different language and rapport we have. Yeah. And uh, you start talking comedian with a, another comedian, and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, feel you get each other. Yeah. 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 It's a it's a it's a fun a fun experience definitely on uh starting out talking to somebody who's been doing it for a long time. And uh I wanna know too, like if there's somebody who was like a mentor for you when you first started that you looked up to and you're like, Thank you God for putting this person in my life <laughs> for like helping me along the way or was it simply just whoever you could find? Yeah, I mean, there was there was never really anyone who was like, "Come, child, let me show you the way." I will teach you. Yeah, it's, um, 
And I do, and I do want to preface like you said, I've been doing comedy a long time, and I guess it's almost ten years. Is a ten years a long time, I guess. But in perspective, that this is a lifelong endeavor. Like, yeah. I feel like I haven't even like almost gotten started, and. Right. I mean, I've talked to comedians 15, 20 years, like 20 years, they're like, you know, I think I'm starting to figure this thing out. Or then I'm just like, even at that, there's always, that's what I love about comedy, it's like this endless endeavor. Yeah. You, know, there, you can always get better. Well, you see somebody like Louis C.K., who's, who was doing it for like 25 years before he actually like started getting famous for his yeah. stand-up, which is incredible. Like, he did yeah. so much writing and other comedy. Mm-hmm. But yeah. And it's, and I never really had any, um, I never really had any mentors or role models. I... I was always proactive in talking to like the veteran comedians though. Like I would I would seek out to connect with them. Like if I went to watch a headliner, yeah. I would be sure I talked to them after. So Would you just wait around? Yeah, just, I would just wait around until all until everybody left. It's that kid again. Yeah, and I would just be <laughs> it's around. That Joel guy. I would just be around <laughs> yeah. all the time. <sighs> always be around. This Sorry. position. So, Why does it work so well for you? Oh, I do. I do yoga, yeah. and like I have flexible hips. I do yoga reason. and don't eat quite as much as you. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to. I promise. I want. I want. Cause like we come from that football background yeah. where it's just like everything, and like I'm I'm 31 now, and my mentally it is everything. But I know that that, that then translates. It, yeah, it, it becomes. It, it, it becomes everything, you yeah. know, like when you're in the mirror, like everything. So, and I'm tall, so it helps to hide it, you yeah. know, but it's like, it's something. I'm basically growing. all love handles, which, is, <laughs> which sucks because like, it's the last thing in my life I actually have a handle on. <laughs> it's in there. Is that, is that part of it? Yeah, yeah we're. I'm all love handles. I like that. And you, you could like grab it or like even like your boobs. Yeah. Boobs I've got that. Th- these are part of them as well. There's so many different bits of just like picking my body apart. Yeah. <laughs> like, Self deprecation is a great way to get sympathy from an audience. Yeah. I feel that way as well. But I, I mean, you're not alone in like the mentality of like everything. Like I, I, I think we're, I was just like conditioned that playing football my whole life. You just eat everything. Yeah. So like now it's just like I want to, but like, because you're, we're we're just ramming our bodies into other human beings. Yeah. Like we want to be the bigger ramming block. Yeah, and then you just, it just becomes a learned behavior. <laughs> it's like I just oh I just eat everything because I'm yeah. a machine. Yeah. And you grow up and you're like oh this machine oh it ages. Yeah. And it's filling. Like and I'm I'm 31. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying something I have to be mindful of. I think something happens when you turn 30. Like you start getting into your 30s. It's just. I think. I, 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 just magic forties, dude. People, mm-hmm. people in their forties are like, "Just you wait." I've heard it is like forty or forty-five is like when it becomes like irreversible. Yeah. Like to where it's, <laughs> it's like, irreversible. Like so there's just like, no turning back. This is you now. Well, I made that joke the other night. Like that's what Jesus was like. He hit thirty-three, and his disciples were like, "Jesus, they're trying to crucify." He was like, "I don't know, man. I'm just exhausted. <laughs> like whatever." <laughs> He's 33. He's just done. There's probably something too, like 30 is a milestone and then 40 and then 50. Because in your 20s, like, we, I had no clue what I was doing. It was just a freaking, I don't know, I don't remember a lot of it. It was mm. a mess, right? And in my 30s, I'm like, I know all. <laughs> but it's great to then have, like, a reason to be doing things. Yeah. So, like, a purpose. A, like, a purpose. Yeah. You know, so, like, a big reason for me not to eat everything every day is just because I'm like, well, I'm gonna have to record this interview. I'm gonna have to be on camera, and I don't really want because like I just I, I just my in laws just took a, my wife and I on a trip, and we just just ate everything and drank yeah. everything, and then I got back and I had to film like two things that week, and the mm. the makeup lady was like, what happened to your eye? And it was just like because I just ate things that I don't normally. <laughs> Yeah. Like there was like like redness and like inflammation, oh, like yeah. still, I'm st- I'm still coming down from that, and I was like, wow, your body really hates you. That's another thing. Like you get food allergies after you're 30 years old. Before <sighs> I was fair. 30, all the rashes and diarrhea were non-food related. <laughs> <laughs> They're all drinking related. <laughs> They're all drinking related. Yeah, it's totally different. So that's why it's good now to like my my profession being my passion that like I just can. Oh no, I'm too focused on this. That's yeah. why I really don't drink. 
because I'm just like too busy, yeah. like with like ambition. Yeah. Same thing with like you know like like smoking weed. Like it's great if you don't have goals and ambition. Like if you just want to do nothing, which college was a great ex- like playground for that. But now, when I'm in the real world and working, I'm like I I have too much to do yeah. to be like like fogging up my brain yeah. or my like my body. Like it's in when you find like your job is what you love to do. It's like it's it's almost like not even a factor. Isn't that a beautiful thing too, though? Like finding <sighs> something you love to do. Like I am super jealous of you that you found it. So you like not young, but I mean you were just coming out of college. Found it right out of college. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is so beautiful though. Like there's a clarity. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because otherwise, I feel like my twenties was all just like trying to figure it out, failing, 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 like bun- running my head into a wall. Why isn't this work? Why don't I love this sales job? You know, mm-hmm. people said I would be great at it because I'm so funny and I, like, why don't I love it? But finding stand up, being like, this is what I'm gonna do, and everything else around it becomes better because of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it let all that experience led you up to that to this moment as well. Right. So like like you said, it'll when you're ready, it will reveal itself. Yeah. To you. Yeah. So it's not like I graduated from college and then was like, oh, I'm doing comedy full time. It's like, oh no. I'm going to be a dishwasher. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to, you know. But with work. that, did you strategically pick jobs that would put you in a position where you could go get up on stage on a regular basis? A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. I, I picked, um, I picked, uh, well, I was living at home. I moved back in with my mom first. And I was actually, when I first, college is crazy. When I first graduated, I was a, I was a, if I'm remembering this correctly, I was a dishwasher. Yeah. College grad. White guy. Get it. Washing dishes. Yeah. But I, I learned Spanish. Yeah. So it all works out. Now I get to record my comedy album. And um, so I was washing, and I did seasonal work at UPS too. So like at peak season, they need driver helpers. Mm-hmm. So I would actually be a driver helper as well as like part of building my income. So, but I did those jobs to free my nights up to be able to do stand up. Yeah. And then once I got a little more vision around what I want to do, okay, I want to move out, so I need to make more money. So I got a job at Enterprise. Hey, I worked at Enterprise. Dude, what get out you? of here. Swear to God. Are you serious? Swear to God. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, man. Couple Swear of Enterprise God. bros. <laughs> the worst. Worst job the ever. Worst. <laughs> The, the worst. I've, I've done tree removal enterprise. The worst. Seriously. The worst like washing cars in full in- suit <laughs> in 110 degree weather. Or like being there on Thanksgiving and not having cars for people and just getting cussed at. Dude. We we were connected to a dealership. Yeah. So when the dealership ran out of this cars, they like li- we would deal with people... Who are just going to get like an oil change and then the dealership upsells them on something. And they're like, well, we don't have a courtesy car. We'll just hook you up with an Enterprise rent a car. And then it becomes, we have to go pick them up. And they're like, yeah. wait, I thought I was just getting an oil change. And then now we're trying to rent them a car by selling them insurance. And they're like, I don't even know. Right. But the worst. It the was wor- absolutely. <laughs> the worst. How long did you work there for? I worked there long enough to get to the airport and then quit. Um, so I don't know how long that was, but that was like my finish line. Of like, I'm gonna make it to the airport. Thirty-one five, is the number. Thirty-one five. Thirty-one five. I don't know what that means. They said the salary is thirty-one five. <laughs> I said I'm in. <laughs> I didn't give a shit what the job was. But you, you know what that job did teach me, beyond just being grateful for not having any job, but that one, <laughs> is almost like um, skill acquisition and and thinking of that. To learn to be good on the phones, yeah. they were literally just like, answer, yeah. answer, answer. You're only good at it by doing it. So that helped me in stand-up actually is like, oh, I'm terrible at this, but the more I do it, the better I'll get. Yeah. So it did help me with that mentality of like if repetition being like the mother of learning and just doing it over and over and over again. You'll get better at yeah. it. The While job somebody's was terrible. screaming in your face. Oh my god! It's <laughs> answer the phone. It's the worst. It's the worst job. <laughs> Welcome to Enterprise. This is did Joel. You, Can I book your reservation today? Did you work in one in Atlanta? Yeah, it was in like Alpharetta okay. or Roswell. Okay. Yeah, I don't remember what branch it was. Um, 
Luckily, luckily the people I worked with are actually cool. Thank goodness. Because we're all, and that's the thing. We're all young. About misery too, like yeah. with football and because football camps suck. That was my funny. <laughs> some of my funniest things was because it was just like miserable. Enterprise is saying I remember doing some of the funniest, stupidest things because we were all so effing miserable. Right. They were yep. like, "Please God, save us from what is about to happen." But you, you learn from those lessons, and yeah. it is like. I, I, I will still use football as like, man, if I can do three a days in the middle of August yep. and full pads, it's like I can I can, you know, go on this hike or you know, I can stand in this line. I've yeah. I've rolled. <laughs> we did this thing in football where we called rolling, where it's literally you just roll. And you're like, that doesn't sound bad, but then you get super dizzy. Yeah. And that was a punishment. And you're in pads oh. too, like full out doing full pads. Full pads. Oh, Helmet, you had to hold your face mask. Yeah, they punt. <laughs> but you live it. You it was, live it. You see, it was now. just strictly abuse, is what football is for most people. But it really does like it gives you it calcifies you in a sense. Yeah. I feel like I'm grateful for the experiences sure. of all of it, and I'm grateful for the enterprise experience and all the other jobs. So I ended up doing um, going from dishwashing to enterprise because I was like, well, I want to move, so I need to make more money. So I used that as an opportunity to save up money to then like move out. Yeah, and. I moved out into a studio apartment in the hood of Atlanta. Yeah. Like pre gentrification, like I was just in it in a studio apartment, and uh, my I don't know how thrilled my mom was about it, but I was like, I'll be fine. <laughs> but it gave look me, at me. <laughs> but it gave me the opportunity to save up money, and then eventually, how I transitioned into comedy full time was. It was kind of the arc of like, okay, let me save up money to move out on my own. Okay, now I'm on my own. Now let me save up money. And it ended up being, I just wrote a, a blog about this on my website. I saved up $10,000 wow. and then like took it full time. But mm-hmm. even saving up that 10000 came down to, I saved up a nice nest egg, moved out on my own, did enterprise for a little bit more. But you got to think, I was at enterprise being at work, what time do we have to be there? 7.30 in the morning. It was 7.30 in the morning? six at night. Till 6 at night. So I would work 7.30 to 6, go home, eat, and then be out till 12, yeah. 1 a.m. Trying to do open mics. Doing open mics. Repeat. Yeah. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Or, out, or then on the weekend, out late, watching headliners at, at um, comedy clubs if I wasn't booked. So like I'm, I was like, I lived, breathed. Yeah. All made all the sacrifices. So then I transitioned from enterprise, saved up my nest egg, got out of enterprise, became a hotel mini bar attendant, where I also got to learn some Spanish, nice. but also not make money, not make much money. But it, I worked during the day, super low pressure stress. I would write all day. Um, I learned how to flip my pen just by <laughs> doing it over and over again while I'm walking around in these different rooms. We did a, I did a, um, I did a little tour. Uh, it was called the Almost Grown Ups Tour. It was yeah. me and two other comics. And we, you know, we're just new comics. We, you know, we're just like, let's go on a little tour, you know? So we uh, we put together a little run of shows. I, one of, part of my job as a hotel mini bar tenant was to ch- check out all the um, expired food and replace it yeah. with um, like fresh food. I collected Cliff Bars for months. That whole road trip we did on that tour. I just had a grocery bag full of expired Cliff Bars. Oh my god! I just ate le- legitimately. I may have, I may have eaten one meal uh, on that trip that like wasn't just Cliff Bars. That, that's some that's dedication right there. See, that's uh, for real. Cause like I loved it. I want to be successful, but I just feel like I'm too well fed. Like I don't think <laughs> too well fed. <laughs> like you know, you have a good meal and you're like, ah. Oh. Be famous tomorrow, kind of deal. I don't know though. When it's it's like if you're you hungry, about, yeah. If you're hungry, literally hungry, you're like, I gotta eat something besides these damn. Clip. Like Jerry Seinfeld does that with the Hungry Man dinners. He oh, talks about the mean, Hungry Man dinners. Like I feel like a Hungry Man has like bred the success of millions of hungry people, of like <laughs> successful people, because they're like. He's like eating the four quadrants of hell, and he's like, I gotta do something with myself. Right, right. Oh, and I should preface, I just remembered the hotels we stayed at had breakfast. Okay. So I would be able to eat breakfast. Continental breakfast. So I'd have like continental breakfast and yeah. of course take some back with me and yeah. all that. So actually, that's that, unbelievable, man. Cliff dude, bars. 
But it was all worth it. I can it. imagine like having to take a crap, like all that fiber. And I don't like, even remember. What I don't the remember pooping. <laughs> like, the whole time. Remember, it was a peanut butter flavor. It was a uh, the ra- It was like a raisin oatmeal raisin yeah. one and a chocolate chip. Wow. Because those are the only three flavors the hotel had, and just rotate. Do you do you hate those things now? Like, can you still eat them? I haven't. But I don't have an aversion. I don't like see one and get queasy. So I think I could. <laughs> like a cliff bar turns the corner and walks in, <laughs> walks in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't. Um, I think I still would because I can handle like I can handle like granola bars and stuff. So I think I'd still yeah. be able to. But that is a good question. I should try like a chocolate chip one and be like, just see what like, happens. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's kind of like one of those things. <laughs> Like you look at like team camp and you're like I could never do three days again, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you did it. It's like I look back now and I was like I don't know if I could ever do that again, but I did it. You yeah. know, and it made me who I am today. So when it's you're all in it. it, yeah, it's totally. When you're in it, you're like I don't know. I'm a comedian. I need, I don't have money. I'm just I'm out here on a tour. Let's do it. Yeah, I think when you do, and Tony Robbins talks about it a lot, burning the boats. Hmm. Like if you burn the if you want to take the island, you burn the boats. Like you make the decision that there's no way. I'm not leaving the island because this is my island now. Hmm. I don't need those boats. So you get rid of them. And so every decision after that is in an effort to take the island. So like it doesn't matter if I'm eating cliff bars or like broken pieces of light bulb. <laughs> Whatever it is to make that thing a reality, mm-hmm. it just happens because you've made that decision. Yeah. And you're just done with any other reality. And that's what helped me to actually become full time is I made a list. Of like the pros and cons of like when it when it came time, okay, I am jumping into comedy as a mm-hmm. job now. It's like I made a list of pros and cons of pursuing it full time and like what's the pro and what what are the cons of this and the pros far outweigh the cons and the cons were risks I was willing to take. Yeah. So I was like, boom, we're doing it. So going full time, what does that look like? I mean what is what is going full time into comedy look like? I ran my own show. I hosted like a weekly show. But how do you get that? Like, how do you even get into that uh, arena? What does full time comedy look like? That's a great question. Just in a Kroger. Hey, everybody! Have you heard about the new plastic bags? Oh, I mean, it's it's being more proactive in like networking. So if I'm out at open mics, I'm okay. actively looking for people that do book shows okay. and like actively. Networking was the big piece. Like for for so many years, I was just tunnel vision. Just get on stage, get on stage, get on stage, get funny, get funny, get funny, get on stage, get funny, repeat. Like just con. Just that is all I'm focused on. I didn't really talk to other comics. I was just like, I'm an artist and I'm a comedian. I don't need other people. Like now I understand the value of networking. Yeah. But literally up until I went full time, really, it was just all no. I'm just getting funny on stage. I'm just doing what I need to do. Just getting the reps, getting the reps. So when it did become full time, it's like. All right, hello everyone. I'm arrived. I'm Joel. Nice to meet you. So yeah. it really, comedy, you know, it's show business, and when you pursue it and it makes becomes your job, congratulations, you just got two jobs. The show is one job yeah. where you're honing your material, you're writing your material, and you're constantly on stage. That's a job, and then the business mm-hmm. is the other job where you have to network and you have to contact bookers and you have mm-hmm. to be proactively seeking ways to monetize this. Yeah. The seeking the bookers and stuff like that because we talk about like getting undeniably funny uh, being that guy who's just hilarious. Mm-hmm. And you're doing it yourself, right? So like how do you know when you're like ready to or do you, do you I mean because isn't it like the booker picks you or are you building a relationship with them like I'm hilarious can you put me on your show? Are you just gambling with yourself and saying if you put me on your show I guarantee I'll be funny or like how do um, I- there's comedians will have like clips like you'll send a book yeah, or a five minute yeah. set of you performing okay um you referrals are mm-hmm. a great way to get material or get uh get jobs as well referrals huge I mean you know most like out of all the comics I've interviewed they've all said yeah all my opportunities have come from like other comedians I know and friends I have in the business it hasn't really been a manager and agent as much as just the friends you make along the way yeah so a lot of my work has come from referrals down the line um it's important to have that stand up set but also if you're out you know when you're out 
at a show, you always want to make sure you do well because, like we said, perform in front of five as if it's 500. Yeah. You don't know if one of those five is like the events coordinator of uh, the YMCA and they have a holiday party they want to come pay you money to perform at. Yeah. Or you just never know who's in that audience, dude. It, it's incredible. It's incredible. And that's what sets me in the mindset of perform regardless of the setting because I do know from personal experience of like, oh man, I remember doing shows and being like, oh, that wasn't that great. And this one comes up, it's like, hey, I have this movie. Would you like to do it? It's like, it's crazy. That's probably how the Kevin Hart thing will happen. I'll just be dead a show. Some casting director will be like, hey, I'm casting a Kevin Hart movie and we need a white guy. Can you be the white guy? Yes. Gary Owen's booked. Can you? <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I'll be Gary Owen's stand-in. That's so funny because that's like what uh, Eddie Izzard... Um, oh, he's great. He's so uh, we, we saw him uh, oh, when he was here in town. You saw him live? Yeah. Oh. So good. He's From the time I was like 13 years old, he's probably one of my favorite stand-up comedians. He's just so different. Um and the way he attacks comedy is so fantastic. But he was he was like he had a bit in one of his first stand up specials when he was talking about I always wanted to be like in films and stuff like that. So I'd go to the movies and I would hope that somebody would see me like, Hey, there's that kid. Yeah, the the <laughs> sneak the sneaky kid over there. Like he was hoping to be found out that way. Like he said he would sneak around the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a dream of all of ours to just be like out in public just right and somebody's finally like that one is special <laughs> right but it does circle back to just not having expectations as right. well so it's like you know if I go into a show expecting the casting director to be there they won't yeah. so I'm not I'm not saying like I go to every show thinking this is the day <laughs> yeah. I really don't even it's not even a thought in my mind but yeah. right now this is me just like verbally manifesting it absolutely but and I like that it's on the record now because a few of the things I've mentioned in this interview are only things I've written down in my journal so now that I'm actually saying them there's like another level of like accountability there's absolute power to that I've I've seen it happen like I wrote a blog I read a blog um, every day or I was writing a blog every day so I started doing this what happened oh okay but you're still well I've, trans- I've transitioned into just like trying to do as much stand as possible I was writing every day for eight months it's great um, and I wrote like two months ago I'm transitioning and doing acting and stand up and I wrote down I will get on stage and do this and like I didn't know exactly when I was going to do it the fear and terror but I took an acting class I was doing stuff with uh, J-Star over at the basement yeah, improv yeah improv and getting up on stage there gave me the confidence well maybe I can get on stage another stage and do stand up and like it just happened and I was thinking about it the other day like how we go from this this thought in our head that seems like this immensely impossible thing this hugely big idea and then we take a step and we do the thing and it's like oh that's that's all it was mm-hmm. you know because even like I messaged you after I, after the first time I did it and I was like kind of beating myself up a little bit, but it was like, dude, you just did stand up for the first time. And I was like, oh yeah, that was my dream. Yeah. Why am I, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like it, it almost, we could become lost in it because it just like, it slips into it. And you're so close to it. Yeah. But it's like, it, I mean, it's like any, learning any new skill. Another reason I like Eddie Izzard is because he's like a renaissance man. He yeah. knows multiple languages. Full he's done German, French. He's, yeah, he's done stand up in all of them. And <laughs> yeah. like, and he, he ran like 50 marathons in 50 something days. Yeah. Like he's just like obsessed with achieving, yeah. which I love and yeah. like being multidimensional. Yeah. So the language of it, when you got to think, when you learn to speak, you start out just like making noises and then you kind of go goo goo gaga and then you start to be able to put a few words together and then you do sentences and then you start to create complex thoughts. Same thing with learning stand up is yeah. like, it is that incremental where you're learning a language, so a lot of it is at first, you're just like, <laughs> all these new jokes you're doing right now, a lot of it's just like, mm, 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 <laughs> that's, what, that's kind of the reaction. They're yeah. like, oh, that's no, cute. And they're like, mm, mm, mm. So then over time, it'll evolve into speaking it more fluently. Yeah. You know? Just so you gotta crawl before you walk, you know? I so like that. you just started. Starting is the hardest part. Yeah. I like that. You did it. <laughs> You're famous comedian now. <laughs> you did it. You made it. Now you just gotta work. <laughs> so you just have to work for the rest of your life. That's that was funny. Doing like the the, the live Q and A today is like 
a lot of the questions were people just asking, so how do I get around the work? Yeah. Which is very common. I mean, I'm not judging anyone that asks. Sure. But a lot of them were this, just in that vein of, how do I not do all the work? Everyone wants a shortcut. Right. We all want a shortcut. Yeah. It's, it's, I made this, um, this other, the other day, I was trying to put it into the routine I was doing. Um, in alcoholic, as an alcoholic, our recovery, like we're always in recovery. And I say, you really know you fucked up your life when the recovery time is forever. <laughs> like if you break your leg it's like six weeks but if you drink too much it's like you gotta do that forever but it's like um, with stand up too or any anything that you love to do any profession that you want to master the time is forever just keep do- why would you stop like w- there's not like I'm gonna retire at some point from being funny or I'm gonna retire at some point right. from writing or doing the thing I love you just keep doing it it doesn't it just evolves with you Don, Don Rickles said, uh, not on hot breath, uh, Don Rickles said that comedians don't retire, they die. Yeah. And that is the truth. Absolutely. Yeah. I totally see that. Because it's a passion. It's like, you know, we go from being like these funny little idiot kids mm-hmm. to being these weird people trying to be on stage and perform for adults, but trying to be like a child on stage to perform for adults and remind them of their childhood. To like just carrying that through, like growing up and just carrying it through the rest of our life. Like we just always want to be funny, you know. It's, it's just everyone. like, yeah. I mean, it's like it'll be. It's just, and you never know who. Even in the writing club we did today, it's like, like five of the people, almost people, couldn't be more different. Yeah. In a lot of senses. Yeah. But we're all pursuing the same destination. Yeah. Of getting that laugh. Right. It's like you can, you can. You can skydive in, you can take a boat in, you know, you can swim in, take a submarine, but we're all trying to get to that same island. Yeah, and I love comedy for that reason because it's the filter of us, how we see the world, and like where people go with some things, it's just so masterful. When you can make somebody laugh off of tragedy or Mm -hmm. something that's very hard to deal with in society, I think that's such a beautiful uh, expression of comedy. Like, Lenny Bruce was bringing all that kind of stuff to comedy back in the 40s and 50s, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he was bringing voice to things that were taboo. But but doing it in such a way that, like, it was hilarious and people wanted to hear it as opposed to being like, keep that crap away from me. It was like, give me some more of that. I want to know more about it. It's got to be funny. It's got to be funny. If it's not funny, it's spoken word. Yeah. And there are, there are platforms for that. Sure. Yeah. But... It's still got to be funny. Yeah. I don't care what cool flannel shirt you wear and ironic mustache you have. <laughs> it's got to be funny. I'm talking about shortcuts, can I was noticing that and like I've watched comedy forever, but like I'm just not starting but like becoming more attuned to it. I f- do you feel like people are trying a shortcut of like just being extremely weird in character, like a sh- very eccentric character? And not actually having any kind of set up, set up joke. Yeah. Up, you know, punchline kind of thing. It's just like I am the punchline. Like I am Zach yeah. Galifianakis, they, whatever. They think they can get by on attitude. Right. But there's got to be structure. There, there's, there's writing under it all. Yeah. There's a great, I don't know if you've seen this. Have you seen Talking Funny? Mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Okay, you'll love this. But it's on, it was on HBO. It's on YouTube. Okay. It's Ricky Gervais, Chris Rock. Jerry Seinfeld. I did see. Okay, I you did see that. that. Yeah, I saw that. So like they were, they were. I mean, it's you know like you know like almost the Mount Rushmore to a lot of people, and they were saying you know you can have the crazy glasses, you can have all the furniture. There's got to be steel in the walls, which is the jokes. Mm-hmm. You've got to have jokes. Louis C.K. said, "It looks like he's a sweaty mess just getting all this out, and it's funny because of the attitude." But he's like, I know every piece of the puzzle. I know where every single laugh is. If you're watching a comedian special, unless, I mean, there are rare occasions where comedians, very few can do this, but they may be improvising in their specials. Most specials you're seeing are like honed into the breath. Right. They know the pauses, they know inhales and exhales and inflections on and facial expressions. like. Everything is so dialed in. Yeah. But 
the magic of comedy is it all appears like we're just talking and we're hanging out. But when people get on stage, that's when they realize, oh, oh, this is hard. Yeah. I don't just talk. No, you. It's like everything but talking. Like people that graduate from my stand-up class, they leave with a script. Yeah. Like they they know the first word they're gonna say. They know the last word they're gonna say. Mm. Say. And I think it's important, especially starting out, to just focus on the writing. Get good at the writing, and the performing will bloom from good writing. Yeah. But a lot of people want the reverse. They're like, no, I'll just say it cool. It'll be funny. No, you gotta write. I'm sorry. There's no way around the work yet again. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a good thing. Because oh, yes. you can become so funny. Yeah. If you can write a good joke. Mm-hmm. I mean, and then that what opportunities that leads to. If you can write funny stuff, it doesn't just mean that you can be a comedian. It means you can help other comedians. You can get in TV shows, write for TV. Of course. Write for movies, whatever it is. Like, the, like that is such a good translatable skill, especially for people who watch this and are writers. Like, if you write comedy, like get out there and try and perform it and stuff, and then be a part of that whole comedy scene. Like, that's a huge door for people. Oh, my gosh. And there are writers on TV shows that aren't necessarily uh, full-time comedians, yeah. but they'll still go out and try out their jokes just to see the response it gets. Right. You know, and there are several, like, people in writers' rooms that aren't really stand-up comics, but they'll still sometimes go try out what they've been creating just to see the public response. Yeah. You've written a book as well. I have. Yeah, I wrote it with uh, Dr. Robert Joseph, actually. Mm. He, um, he was one of my students. It was, I mean, it's just so crazy, you know, like when you're ready, the opportunities present themselves. And yeah. he's, I mean, he, he was the gentleman in the writing club today. Yeah. Uh, he's like, he like went to MIT. He's like a super smart doc, guy. Super smart guy. And he's a professor in his own right. And he, he showed up to class one day. And he just slaps like a, a pamphlet, or not a little pamphlet, just like a little binder down. And he's like, we're writing a book. And I was like, yes, we are. And he, and he kind of showed me what he had done because he was so inspired by like the class. Wow. And just how helpful it had been. He's like, there's more people should know about this. And it's pretty much just like my comedy class just synthesized into a book, taking people from how to generate ideas to actually turn them into jokes to then refining them into longer bits to then organizing them into like a stand-up set. Wow. So it takes you through the whole life cycle of a, like a joke creation. That, All from him being writing a book. <laughs> but, when was this done? Uh, a few years ago. Wow. I don't, yeah, a couple years ago. But that, the idea is the easy part. Even like the book, even this book I was like, Oh, this will be easy. It's all my curriculum. We'll just put it in a book. And then, like, writing... The fact you... How many books? You said three? Three, yeah. Dude, any writer... Like, the fact you completed a book... I can see how most people only, like, get halfway through or don't complete it. Because, like, even this book, based on curriculum I already have, was laborious. And a lot of refinement. And a lot of trial and error. And even creating what I did like took time and it was like halfway already created yeah. so I kind of well, we wrote a thesis in college you that's true what was your thesis on uh, Netflix <laughs> it was about <laughs> it was about Netflix it was about Netflix this was what uh, eight years ago this was 2010 yes yeah, so almost 10 years ago I need to read it yeah to were you like I predicting said. the future well I I was going I was going to write about the UFC because I could I was seeing how disruptive that was going that was becoming and now like UFC went, dude, from like the eighteen and up aisle at Blockbuster mm-hmm. to now it's on like ABC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I mean. Like it's crazy. <laughs> it's everywhere. So like I, I was, I would, and I think this is. Uh, I heard Chris Rock say this, not on Hot Breath yet. It was on Inside the Actor Studio, but like great comics are. I'm, whoa, Joel. He yeah, maybe he said comics. I don't know, but he said great comics are uh, like psychic in a way yeah. like, he had a Chris Rock show where he had a sketch about OJ Simpson like writing a book saying like if I did it this is how I would do it and then he and later he on did really, do so it. the same thing with um, 
what are we talking about? I got lost on calling myself a great comic. <laughs> so I'm always looking for like future trends. Yeah. And I think all comedians are looking for trends and getting ahead of the curve. Yeah. So with uh, Netflix, I just saw like, I didn't predict it was going to become like embedded into televisions. But I think I was like, oh, it's like disrupting entertainment and how we consume content mm. in terms of like blockbusters were closing. Yeah. Everything I'm doing is pretty much on Netflix now, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even have cable anymore. Right. Like it is like Netflix. Yeah. So I need to read it to see what I predicted or like what my view of it was back then. But looking back on it, I was like, oh, Netflix. Cool. You should be doing stock trading and stuff, man. Oh man, I need money first. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, need money, I need money to invest. I've got ten dollars. What can I buy? <laughs> what, did, what did you uh, write yours on? Uh, training high school athletes. Okay. It was basically oh, yours was PE though, and mine was physics. Case, yeah. Yeah, yours is physics. Sorry. Yeah. It's called. <laughs> <laughs> It's like outdoor rec majors. I was like, oh, weed. You're like, no, it's called outdoor rec. It's called that. Yeah. Sorry. I like to say exercise science. It's like, they didn't offer exercise science, but it's physical education. Yeah, I didn't mean to. Yeah. It's okay. We were in different fields. It's just stupid. But we what, was your, what was your was, point of view on it? It was, uh, it was basically like CrossFit before. It was like the intensity. Awesome. Like how important intensity is in exercise. Mm. It was like, it doesn't matter. You can do programs, X, Y, Z, however, however way you want to train. If the intensity is not matched, then there's the results won't be there. And like it was basically a pr- showing how to increase intensity over time and uh, duration of exercise. And when we went back and read it, I was like, "Huh, <laughs> I'm pretty." I need to read it's mine, not bad. Said, dude. That I mean, especially you're talking like how CrossFit is now. I mean, it's yeah in intensity like with like Orange Theory, and they're all doing it. Now. Peloton, you know. I mean, yeah. it is more. And you, I mean, I've heard. You get working out hard for twenty minutes is way more effective than an hour of just like, like jogging over. Yeah. yeah. So like intensity does play a big part. Yeah. And like um, intervals and yeah, like hit training, you know, like all that the the bursts are seen to what is getting the most results. Well because it, it affects the, the um slow twitch muscle fibers, fast twitch muscle fibers, and your body just responds to it differently metabolically. Because <laughs> When you're working in a sprint capacity, you're not necessarily using ox- oxidative process. You're not using oxygen. Um, but you do it with like CrossFit, you do it in such a way where you're hitting the oxidative, you're hitting the anaerobic, which is not oxygen. Um, you're hitting all the different phases of training in the same training routine. So you're more well-rounded than if you were just to say, go for a jog, then your lungs get better. Your, that, the way you perform like that gets better, but your muscles, your skeleton, your skeletal system, your ligaments, um, the way your brain functions, fat metabolism, everything is incorporated when you do the cross training aspect. Mm. So that's why it's been so, I mean, in 20 minutes of high intensity, you get your heart rate up, you get your breath going, you get your muscles aching and pump full of blood nutrients. Yeah. Is that science? Is, dude, uh, that, is, that is the great part about it. Oh. <laughs> well, it's, it's cool to, for like, you know, things to be based on like facts and science and not just theories anymore. This is awesome. And, guessing you know this is all stuff i made up <laughs> it's proof is in the pudding crossfit is huge it is and people get yoked doing it yeah. and also beat up from Heard. all like the forms i owned a crossfit gym for a while what i yeah I what messed up my no i'm not saying what surprisingly i was like that's amazing yeah i did like, and how did that go? It went great until some person, some other stuff happened. Then your 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 my life fell issue apart. got in the way. No, no it wasn't. It was well, my ex wife. Is that who you're calling my issue? Oh, I don't know. It's my I didn't know which one you were gonna refer to. It was my ex wife. She, was, she was my issue for sure. Really? Yeah. But it's 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 another thing that I realized that I loved interacting with people because I grew the business from two people in my carport to over forty in a 5,200 square foot facility within six months. What? I loved interacting. I loved like getting people in on their dream of being in great shape Yeah. and like having a fun time exercising. I hated the business of it. I hated like putting out classes, like doing the marketing, like making sure the payments were taken care of, all this kind of stuff. I know it's all necessary, but I just wanted to be the guy. But it was, it wasn't because of any of that. It was because of something else. But how, how did you build, because like I, I had been teaching classes like with a, a comedy school here, mm-hmm. but this year in my, I've been like really 
really um, intentional about having a growth mindset. Yeah. So I'm now starting my own comedy school. Yeah. So what I'm doing now is all under the Joel Byers brand. Yeah. It's like, how did you build it's, a it, clientele? Well, it's because th- these people are so afraid, right? Like you have to understand, getting to understand where the fear is of not moving forward with their making the commitment of money. Why are you not making the commitment? It's because you don't believe somewhere in your head that the money's going to benefit you by giving you the results you want. But like taking them step by step through the vision that I see for them, how it worked for me, like what I do personally, and showing them that and like painting the picture for them. Like I would take somebody on a tour of my facility and it wasn't anything. It was just like a welded together pull up rig, um, a bunch of weights in this big giant open space. And I would show them that if you show up here every day, I have a program built for you that you will get in shape, you will lose weight. I had pictures, I mean, I've lost 100 pounds three times in my life. Wow. Yeah, one of the times it wasn't my 100 pounds to lose, it was some kid, but it's fine. Ah, still trying out material. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll work, work on, on we'll that. We'll keep trying that <laughs> one. Still keep, try, keep trying well, I've that lost, one. I've lost 100 pounds three times, That's and crazy. right now I'm, I've lost uh, 60 pounds uh, in the past 11 months. I know how, how, to, how to do it. I understand the process of it. Getting somebody to believe in you. And that's what all sales is, is getting somebody to understand what you're doing and who you are and how it can relate. And that trust, like, they want to trust that you're, they're in good hands. And, like, just by being enthusiastic and showing up for them is so important. But it, it really is just building relationships with people. It's like... So you went from 2 to 40 from referrals? Went from two no by talking to I worked night shift at a factory uh-huh. in Mary or in, or in Cleveland Tennessee, I signed up everybody that I worked with on the line in the factory all became members of my gym. I worked from eleven o'clock at night to seven a.m. and every single one of them were members of my gym. And then people I would see around town, I got people from other gyms that knew me when I, when I worked out. Oh, okay. You know? And just like building that relationship, they're like Matt's a fun guy. I love working out with them, like, you know, just creating an environment. And one thing I noticed about the class today, um, we're shooting this after we did a writing class, the comfortability. People, not only, like, convenience is the number one thing for most people, but feeling comfortable is a safe space. Yeah. Like, I was weird enough for everybody to feel safe. You? Like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, when I was, it was, I was open and vulnerable and weird enough that other people weren't afraid to like break down if they were working out and scream and like go crazy or whatever it was, they felt like they could be themselves. And like getting to be in a place where uh, you allow people to feel comfortable being themselves, people will pay for that over and over again. Because they want to be themselves. People want to be themselves. Right. We don't get to do it enough. And then if you give them that opportunity and then you give them the service of, I'll show you how to be funny to where you can make this a career for yourself, mm-hmm. that's like, you know what I mean? Jeez, I need your help. I'm all about collabing, bro. Yeah. Like, I love working together. I mean, I, it almost makes me want to um, not do my class yet until I have more people that you find. And <laughs> <laughs> like you. <laughs> that I find. No, I mean, because... I've never, like, I was terrible at Enterprise because, like, I didn't believe in, like, the product. Like, yeah, the product. I'm not selling insurance. I was terrible at <laughs> I it. I was too. But it's like, I now, I, f- I do believe in what I'm providing, and I do believe comedy as being a service that does empower people. Yeah. But there is still a slight disconnect in the marketing aspect of, or, like, I don't know. There's a mental, there's still, uh, it's, it's probably my biggest weakness in doing everything I do really is like the marketing side mm-hmm. and trying not to come off as salesy even though I do believe in like my comedy classes and my workshops and everything there's still a block like but I don't wanna if you know. so I think you already have the undeniably funny if you've seen any of Joel's stand up you're funny already you've already got the product <laughs> dab <laughs> until <laughs> then my wife's yeah. like he dab <sighs> Again. What is he, 12? Yeah. <laughs> she hates it. That's why I do it. I know. 
We have, as 30 year old white men, we have to dab. <laughs> it's like part of our curriculum. Look how cool we are. Ah, <laughs> that's, that's the thumbnail right there. Yeah. That's the thumbnail. Ah, that, that won't be the thumbnail. <laughs> I think you already have that. And it's about like attraction because people know you're funny, know you offer a service, mm-hmm. and I'll make it accessible to them. You know, like if it's, if it's something that they know is available. Like, I would just go around and just let everyone know, yeah, hey, guess what I did? I opened a gym. It's great. I'm so excited about it. Oh, uh, you know? okay, cool. Because it is. I was, I was like, hell yeah, I did this thing. Don't you want, you, why don't you, why wouldn't you want to be a part of it? I'm they, there. They almost like gravitate towards you. My enthusiasm. And your enthusiasm. Yeah, for the thing. Not the thing. Right. It's not the thing. It's, it's not the thing. It's, it's, yeah, it's never the product. It's the person. Oh. Yeah. Whoa. It's always, and that's in any any sales relation. It's it's all about the the person behind the product. Whoa! But you have the product, right? You've got and you've got the ability. You've got the skill. You've got all that stuff. You've got everything necessary. Just be the enthusiastic Joel. Just marketing, just online, or like when I'm out go, of shows. Or? Go out, open mics, bro. Like there's so many people who need help. Like I haven't been doing this long, but. I at least tell a joke, you know. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like tell a joke, like even if it's a knock knock joke, for God's sakes. But the 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 adage is that comedians don't have money. Sure. So but if and then you you weed out the who's serious and who's not. Who wants to? Nobody has money until they find something of value. You know. Yo. And it is like I am looking. Most of my clientele. I don't even call them client. I mean, most of my students have been like people pursuing comedy or sketch or improv or acting or it's like it's been more in that space but I would like to start getting into more like people like in Toastmasters or people pursuing public speaking not necessarily wanting to do stand up but they want to learn comedy to then empower their profession absolutely and that's public speaking is the number one fear for most people it's like Mm -hmm. number one in the world right getting in front of your peers and speaking yeah yeah if you can get people to feel confident and then also be funny and own a room I mean you I mean that's like how you make CEOs and man like that's how you up your career and that's how up the Joe Bars comedy that's how you up the Joe Bars level yeah by letting people see that yeah you may be working at this level right now but if you can own a room they're gonna want you to own the room Mm. own the room yeah (sighs) right no yes yes that's I mean that's where and thinking of the growth mindset as well is like okay I've been teaching comedians and things like that but it's like who else could I help with comedy and I was like well why are you why are you why are you reaching to the side why not reach up yeah you know so I've been thinking more like executive level oh yeah because they're always trying to be funny they have to speak in front of people but it's like they all kind of suck at it and it's just like always this awkward like I've been in corporations and the if you have a good leader that's funny and relatable and authentic you're like I'll get on the phone I'll do whatever and that's this what guy's a comedian awesome. is comedian's a leader of the room right you're the leader of the pack yeah. when you're on that stage yeah. you are that leader yeah. so how do you how do I connect how do I tap into that that market yeah I mean, I, this just turned into like a mastermind. This just turned yeah, into like, we're mastermind. He's right now. just like, <laughs> tell me everything. I think I, there's a lot of things you can do. I think being being there is one. Like, hey, I'd love to, love to come in and talk to some of your uh, management about some of the classes I offer. Like oh, going right. into any business. Um, I mean, I've got I've got friends who do like uh, public speaking, teach classes, who are in sales and all this kind of stuff that would benefit from learning how to write a joke, learning how to better present the material um, I think we all do they're, they're everywhere I mean that's the ma- majority of us aren't com- aren't trying to be comedians yeah the majority is we're just trying to you know make a paycheck and get by um, I think I think it's available I, I mean you can walk down the street and there's buildings everywhere just walk into oh, that's true just go to where they are I think it's the sca- it's, but it's scary though right it's like I don't <laughs> but even I though that's like Toastmasters and doing a doing talking to a Toastmasters group about how comedy can yeah help their public speaking. I know I need to get into Toastmasters too. I, I want to go there because I think that's another 
great avenue to work on just public speaking. And it's kind of like we're talking about with the writing club, getting around people invested in their craft. Yeah. Like you go to Toastmasters because like those are other people that are like invested in their craft and want to get better. Yeah, and you always want to be around people who are doing the doing the damn thing. Of because, course. And there's so many talented people, and it's so great to be able to like see somebody's gift mm-hmm. and be like, oh, that is so beautiful. Because it allows you to tap into your gift a little bit more yeah. when you see somebody else realizing theirs. You know, but I think starting out just where you are, like that's what I had. That's what I did. Where wherever I was, whatever else I was doing, everyone else that was there was coming with me. <laughs> like Jerry Maguire stuff. Interesting. But like I actually brought people. Okay. <laughs> Besides a goldfish and a weird secretary. I never saw Jerry Maguire. What? I mean, when I grew up, when I was growing up, it was R. I wasn't allowed to see it. Oh yeah. And then I just never. Circle back. It's such a great movie. I thought I wanted to be a sports agent for a while. That's how good it was. Really? Yeah, well, apparently you were good at sales and all that. Still don't. It uh, seems to be good. It is it is the enthusiasm. It's like... But now you're a comedian. I, because I wanted... I, I love making people laugh more than anything else. I always thought that like sitting around joking with my friends, that's where my life... That's what I wanted to do forever. Like, let me just sit around and joke with my friends. Mm-hmm. How do I do that? And then I started doing the interview show and podcast, and I was like, oh, it's kind of happening. But I've always wanted to be on stage doing it because I feel like I'm so much better than everybody else. And I need to make sure that they know <laughs> how, much, how much better you are. How much better. This is why I'm standing up here. I'm better. You're superior. I'm superior. So you started. Yeah. What's next for you? No, we're talking about you, Joel. <laughs> this was hot breath for a second. It turned into hot breath. Sorry. Nothing. I'm doing this. I'm going to be making a movie soon. Okay. Probably. I'm going to take my book, Trent Foster and the Council of Ten, turn that into a script. Wow. Yeah. And try to try to pitch it to some places. Um, I want to do more stuff like this. Like, I took a break from the, uh, the podcast and the YouTube channel for a little bit. Ooh. Just because I had done so many. And I didn't even have to record. Like, I still have them coming out. Oh, so, oh, you're still uploading. It's still no. It's they're all uploaded. They drop on their own now. Like I don't even have your to schedule. Re- yeah. Oh, you're organized. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I mean, and this <laughs> I think this is important for you know people listening as well as like consistency. Yeah. Is key. Yeah. So like my podcast is every Monday at eight a.m. Yep. And if I if I'm not going like when I went on uh, a trip with my in laws. The week before, in that episode, I was sure to tell people in the intro, hey, I'm going to be gone the next two weeks. There won't be any episodes, but when we get back, we'll be right back on track. I, you, you need to speak to your audience, whether it's two or 200,000, speak to them yeah. as, if you, like, as if they're sitting next to you and be like, hey, I'm about to leave for two weeks. Are you going to be all right? Yeah, there's plenty more for you to keep up with here. I just need yep. to go to this. Like, I, I realize the power of that. I posted an older interview, mm-hmm. um, and I didn't, I didn't say in the title that it was an older interview. And someone tweeted me and was like, "Hey, we don't mind you posting old interviews. Just let us know that it's an old interview." And I was I like, my old day, <laughs> I was like blown away. Like, wow, people really do care. Yeah, like it, it, it matters. So like, treat it's your tribe. Treat it, treat it like an interpersonal relationship. So yeah. consistency. Yeah. Every Monday at 8 a.m., there's a there's a new hot breath out, mm-hmm. and that's how I've been able to snowball and build up like a, a following because of that consistency that builds that trust that then makes people want to share it with other people. Yeah, they know you'll be there on Monday. Yeah, yeah. reliable. I do mine every two days. Another one comes out, and I'm pretty sure people are just like, "Would you just fucking give it up, bro?" <laughs> every two days. Yeah. What? Oh my, and you said you had so many in the... Oh my god. You I, just dove in, dude, didn't you? You just... I was doing like three interviews a day. Oh my... Every two... I'm like, I do one once a week. You're like, every two days. Well, that's the... That's why I was like, I had to take a break. And because I was like, oh my god. And I wanted I wanted to get more like this. Like, one, like actually in a location. <laughs> every two days? I know. It people takes- are... Other people are just like... <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but there's something to be said about the learning curve and the repetition and you learning and getting better faster because you've done so much. 
But it's like every two days, who can keep up with that? I know. I like, people can't digest it. I know. And my, who, <laughs> eat it. <laughs> people release stuff every day, so it's like I'm not saying the right or wrong way. Like uh, I had to learn how to edit video, build a website, um, interview people. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, all within like a week. So. It's been an amazing process, but I can totally edit the crap out of anything now. Like professional, I did book. I've done book trailers for people because I know how to, like because of that skill. Book trailers. Yeah. Like, oh, you filmed and edited. Like I've made book trailers for people's books. Like you know how they'll have like a big time book trailers for blockbuster movies. Mm-hmm. Like I did that for like a person's book. Oh, cool. Yeah. Whoa. So the skills we learn along the way, right? It's pretty amazing. Well, every, every skill informs the other as well. Yeah. So, like, I've, I'm have i a stand-up comedian, but I've also done improv classes and sketch classes and acting classes. Mm-hmm. And I'll do Photoshop as well, and I'll do video editing and audio editing. But the creative process, it, it's not, like, one-dimensional. When right. I edit a, a poster, it still helps me and strengthens my ability to edit a joke. Like, just yeah. exercising that creativity. It all... It all helps each other. Yeah, definitely. It, yeah, it's like an ever-expanding uh, plant. Ooh. Almost. Oh. Out in different ways. Um, That's awesome. I know. I love that. It's so professional. <laughs> it's so... If we this is how it's done. If we didn't point out that it was there... <sighs> oh, that it is. This, <laughs> this episode's bugged. It is. Wait, you're going you're gonna to edit... You edit these? Like, you... you I will I'll Photoshop the... Um, but, but you, this will be just a tree of dildo. You, <laughs> you just keep them as is. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, yeah. I'll edit some stuff, like all the racist stuff you said. <laughs> <laughs> all the stuff about... Now they're going to be like, wait, when did he say the race? Now they're looking for a jump cut, like when... Yeah, when John... It just zooms in on you, and then we're back, and I'm like crying. And I'm like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So the, it was around the time I was talking about doing those urban comedy shows. That's right. <laughs> it's, Not me. It's so amazing, man. Um, the, this whole process, how it's all worked out. Uh, <clears throat> I know there's so many good things coming for you. Oh. For sure, because like, Appreciate I'm not just that, BSing man. you when I'm talking about like the Hot Breath podcast is like fantastic. Appreciate that. You do an amazing job. One thing I notice uh, with a lot of interview shows is that the person interviewing does more talking than the person being interviewed. There's such a skill to a conversation where both people have time to breathe, mm-hmm. right, and respond. And like Pete Holmes does his radio show or his podcast, Love Pete Holmes. It's insane <laughs> if you listen to it. Yeah. But when you get a chance to hear other people, you know. That's been my biggest compliment, I think, is not only how educational, oh, yeah. and it, it's, I mean, in starting the podcast, I kind of, I created the show I wanted to hear. So many comedians have podcasts, and I'm always looking, even like how we set this up. Mm-hmm. Like right now, I was like, oh, let's, this sounds like I'm going to be good in here. Let's go into this conference room. I don't know, the lighting's terrible in here. Let, oh, this, that couch looks cool. I don't know, but then I found this side, like... I'm always looking, because I want this episode to not only be great, like, just from content-wise, but I want it to look great. I want people to enjoy what they're seeing. Yeah. And that's going to help your show stand out yeah. from all the Skype interviews. I'm really show. glad that you care about that, because I'm the worst. I'm just like, ah, whatever. <laughs> My first interview was in a bathroom. Like, me and, like... That's great. It was hilarious. It was so stupid. But, I mean, it, I mean you started. You yeah. Know? You started. Your first comedy show was at a... Coffee, coffee shop tea. in the middle like at like seven yeah to the sound of espresso being made it's true you know like but i love that you have that perspective on it it's very nice i just yeah. i looked at i looked at comedian podcasts and i took note on what i liked and what i didn't like mm-hmm. about them so like i loved it when comedians talk about the craft but rare there weren't any shows that really just it was like the inside the actor studio for comedians yeah and I noticed, like, Pete Holmes, for example, I noticed he would always just talk over his guest. But then yeah. I noticed, like, Terry Gross on NPR lets her guests talk. So I would, yeah. you, you'll hear in my early interviews, 
I'm almost doing a Terry Gross impression where I'm like talking very monotone and this is very astute. The question I'm asking yeah. is well researched and well rehearsed, but now with my interviews are more conversational, but you can hear the evolution yeah. of like how almost like I'm like stoic in there. Like we're here to talk business. Tell me everything you know. Yeah, give me your gifts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I need to know. But I really created the I created the podcast I wanted to hear. Yeah. And it all it turns out a lot of other people want to hear it too. So when I first started doing this, my, all my the beginning of my shows were me screaming at the top of my lungs, like flailing out of control on the camera. And you can like if you go back and I did this, I do this all the time, and this is a great tip for anybody who's doing public speaking. I haven't if you're nervous, if you let out a yell, mm. it immediately quells most of your nerves. But if you yell like on stage towards other people, what happens is, and this is done like in battle, right? You, your war cry. That fear, that fear. Seriously, <laughs> shut up, Joel. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm learning. In that life. that battle cry would transmit your fear from you to the other to the people. Mm. So you're no longer afraid, and everyone else is like, oh my god, <laughs> what the hell is happening? If you've never done it, like, honest to God, try it. I do it all the time. Like, I go to AA meetings, and I'm, like, before I share, or I give out chips or whatever, I'm always just like, Whoa! and everyone's like, you yell? Oh, yeah. At the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's great. And for I feel, who? not for me. Oh, but for... For them, they're just... They they know me by now. But, like, they get... They're like, whatever. So, first... <laughs> first did you do this first day? You, like, yelled? If I'm nervous, I yell. But, like, first day? No, 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 no. I don't, I don't want you to be, like, an open mic, and you're nervous, and you just yell in the middle of the show. No. You go to your if car. I yell, <laughs> if I yell, it's always at the beginning. Okay. Because it empowers me. It gives me that, like, uh, yeah. I'm ready to go to war now. Okay. If you haven't tried it, man, if you've had nerves and you need, to, if you have nerves and you don't know how to get rid of them, I swear it works every time. Scream. Like, hold the mic away from your face. Even if you have to, just like turn around and yell. And then turn back and you will feel different. So will the audience. Exactly. But I don't know if they're willing to laugh. <laughs> I, I, I would have breakdowns on stage and I would yell. Would you really? Like, I. Early on, you know, I if someone got up to go to the bathroom, I would yell at them. <laughs> this is a bar on a Tuesday at eleven. They don't even know there's a comedy yeah. show happening. There's, I'm up there telling terrible jokes about going to WWE. Yeah. And then they get up to go to the bathroom. How dare you? Do you know who I am? <laughs> Dude, I would go off on people. And then I realized over time that anger doesn't work for me like yeah. Lewis Black can get away with it Sam Kennison but like yeah. I look 12 me getting angry is not going to connect with the audience right so I learned that through just a lot of failure yeah. you know and it's not dir- okay so it's not yelling directly at people <laughs> it's just yelling in general yeah I, yeah but it's, uh, that, <laughs> that energy that energy yeah. because there's anxiety has become such a great tool it's what gets us out of bed in the morning. Anxiety? Anxiety. Like, think about it. If you didn't feel like, oh, I have to upload my podcast, I've got to go, I, go, I have to write, I have to do this, like, there's anxiety there. Like, thank God for that, right? Because otherwise, I'd just be like... Pfft. Yeah, try to, I guess, frame it as, like, motivation or ambition. I mean, anxiety can have a negative connotation. Sure. So I don't want it to be, like, a crippling... You know, I mean, I'm just saying, becomes, we can frame whatever motivates you, you can frame yeah. it to whatever. But, like, if I hear anxiety, then it makes me feel like there's, like, nerves involved, and it's, like, it almost, yeah, it, it almost, like, debilitating. Debilitating? Debilitating? <laughs> I don't know. I went liberal arts. I don't know. Words are hard. These words. Right? That's right. Words are hard. Words I are speak hard. for a living, but words be hard. <laughs> words are hard. I just want you to know, I haven't been looking at my watch for the time. This isn't even on. This is like a, a fancy bracelet. It's just a set piece. I just didn't want you to... Like, I, I saved the battery, so I won't even use it until I need it. So I guess we're done here. Um. I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't want you to think 
that I was I've been looking at my watch like when is this over because it's not even on it's literally it's a digital watch it's not synced up to my phone I use it only for time it just looks cool and was on clearance at Target dude watches are so affordable now <laughs> totes it's super one. affordable. Super, it was on clear. There was a Batman and a Superman watch, just like all chromed out, for like fifteen bucks at Walmart. And I was like, I might. I didn't buy them. Thank goodness. But uh, what a terrible yeah. purchase that was. <laughs> it's such a good investment. I feel an investment <laughs> into, <Yeah>. into debt. <laughs> Looking to make uh, more of a moron. Invest debt. Invest debt is what they call it. We've all got debt. Um, I don't, so one of my one of the things I don't do well okay. on my show is end the show. I yeah. thought you were about to say that you don't end it well. I don't end anything well. Like oh my, <laughs> until now, anything like my all of my relationships have been absolute nightmares. Really, <laughs> in the end. But with comedy, you're not looking to end comedy. Absolutely, no. I'm you're just that starting. To the grave. And you 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 got the bug to where you performed. Several times in a week, like you did it once on Tuesday, and then you were like, "All right, did it later that show? night." You did it later that night. You did it twice. Yeah, and then you did it on Thursday mm-hmm. at the next available show, right? Yeah. yeah. So you're you're hooked. I'm hooked, man. Congrats. And I was like fiending for. I've re- when I don't get to do it, I record myself doing it. Yeah. And recording congrats. myself doing it feels great. Mm-hmm. I end up. I'm like, I'm just gonna do five minutes. It's gotta be funny five minutes, and it ends up being like an hour and a half. <laughs> me just like talking. talking that should be another podcast <laughs> content king <laughs> I, I, have, I have so many videos of me talking in my bedroom every other day guys releasing a podcast they're like two hours long it's like people have things to do <laughs> they're not just like wandering around outside but you people you can repost stuff yeah you can repurpose episodes I've had I've posted older interviews that the newer one has more listens than the older one does just because of timing right I need to do that I just haven't needed to but it's also cool to like I've interviewed a lot of people like before the blow up yeah so you know it's like Rob when I interviewed Rob you know he I mean he had just opened up for Chappelle and he had done some cool things but you know now he's like on like he is, he is in the industry. He is like a name, so it's like if I reposted that now, it would probably get more listens than the first me posting at the beginning. Yeah. So I mean, I've done that with a couple people that like, maybe they were releasing something. So I'll be like, hey, you probably seen this comic on, um, you saw him on Joe Rogan. Well, mm-hmm. I interviewed him. Da da da, and here it is. For yeah. Your convenience, like. People, people appreciate it. I think it's really cool too, like getting it at ground zero. Like, there's so many authors I've talked to now that I know are going to be fantastic. Yeah. Like, and I'm going to be like, I got the exclusive. Like, and they're going to be more willing to give you the next exclusive. Yeah, because they don't hate me yet. They haven't heard oh, my yeah. stand-up. That guy doesn't like babies. <laughs> no, I haven't heard that joke yet. There's a lot we got to work on. <laughs> <laughs> but you're committed, and that's, that's half the battle. You Super started. Committed. Yeah. Now it's just the work. Yeah, man, and you're helping me. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, yeah. Dude, what do you do on Mondays? Like, what do you like it or what not? What do you do on Mondays? Monday do you, nights. Do you work on Monday nights? No. I uh, <laughs> I have a uh, I do um, acting class with uh, J Star. On Mondays? Improv. Monday. Right now, yeah. With graduations in two weeks. <sighs> My class is on Mondays. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? It's like, uh, well, I'm gonna start, man. Like. Set. No, I just I just want you to take my class in exchange for you helping me with my my problems. Yeah, I'll do it for sure. I thought that would be great, like just also to use me, like if I'm any good, like like look what I helped Matt Whiteside go from a, a fat alcoholic <laughs> retard to. <laughs> No, you gotta Dude. tell them the joke now. They don't. I don't All right. So when I was, yeah, I have to. Okay. So when I was a kid, I wasn't very smart, and my teachers all thought I was retarded. And I know I'm not supposed to say the word retarded. I'm just telling you what they called me. Um, so they had me tested. It turns out I wasn't retarded then. I was just stupid. But don't worry, I'm fully retarded now. <laughs> Retarding all laughters from an audience. That's right. Laughter party. That's what we call them. But I think that would be great. Like, look what I did for Matt. Okay. You know, 
Oh, that might be good. <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just love you've been doing it less than a week, and you're like, I could be your grasshopper. Yeah, I'm gonna be the best comic ever, and you could say you did it. Yeah, you want that? <laughs> you want that? <laughs> you want that kind of action, man? Yeah, yeah. I see potential. I mean, there's like with anything, you know. I mean, there. I've seen so many comics with potential; they just weren't willing to do the work. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. I think you need, yeah, with anything, if you're not willing to do the work, there's no point, right? You're you're only going to get as far as as hard as you're going to work or something. I agree with that. (laughs) I agree with that. It's about willingness. Like in the program of AA, which everyone who watches this knows I'm an AA, uh, it's about willingness. Is that automobiles? Anonymous? Is that true? I think I have a membership. I have a card in my wallet. I think they help with. They help tow trucks when you're drunk driving. <laughs> you know what's great about AA? I have so many more friends now. Uh-huh. It's just a shame that they'd all like to remain anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. That's funny. Have you said that? No, that's something else I've written down. That's a good one. Thanks. Do any of them want to take a comedy class? I'm sure. They love. There's some that love comedy. Well, well, I think they all like to laugh. Well, let me know if anyone wants to take comedy class. They can start late. <laughs> I mean, the class starts tomorrow, and I'm like, I have like four people. Hey, man, that's great. Yeah, I mean, it is great. What time does it start? And I'm grateful for those four people. Yeah. But my mortgage... is <laughs> like... And that's, I mean, that's the thing, you know, with any endeavor. I'm, I'm not delusional about the long-term benefits of what I'm building, but these are like the growing pains of like, okay. Well, that's why I worked at a factory at night. Mm-hmm. When I had my gym, because I couldn't pay the bill, I I had I was working at a factory making like eleven dollars an hour, so I could pay the bills for the facility. <sighs> Praying, knowing that I was going to not sleep for months, <sighs> while I got these people, and like eventually I was able to pay for the place we worked out at it, the equipment with the memberships. But like I didn't sleep literally for like six months. I slept like an hour a night. And I think that has something to do with my brain. That's <laughs> important. It's I was I was having like hallucinations on the job. Was, and you with the exercise science background, you should understand the value of sleep. Oh, I know it. I know it. Sleep I was hallucinating down. on the job in the factory. I'd hallucinate while on the line, and then I'd go and train a class at seven in the morning, eight in the morning, and then at noon. And then I'd go home and sleep for like two or three hours and I'd get up and I'd have to go get my kids from school. Ugh. And then I'd go back and teach the six and seven o'clock class and then go to work. You taught all of them? Yeah, I was there for all of them. I had a, I had a partner that would teach some, but I was there for all of them. Because that's the, that's the other thing. Like, I knew, and once the business fell apart, like he tried to, he took it basically, like because of some shade stuff. Um, the business was gone in a month. Like, everyone was like, I'm out. Because it was you. I brought him all there. And he, he was like, we don't need a salesman. I was like, hey, you think I'm a salesman? <laughs> like, I'm the reason this gym is here, man. Right. But, like, that enthusiasm, like, I wanted to be there. It wasn't just, like, I felt like I needed to be there. I was like, I wanted to be in that environment. That was mm-hmm. my baby, you know. And I think it's the same thing with this. It's like, I want to be around all of it, you know. And you got that, too. See the light, yeah, yeah. Light. I just need to make more people aware of it. Yeah, that's all it is. And there's so many people. You know how many people there are? I know. Like, there's 7.5 billion people, and we're not even trying to have kids. Like, people aren't even trying. <laughs> I, I tell you, I, all my, almost everyone I know with a kid, not one has been like, yeah, we planned that. Yeah, nobody's trying. Every, like, everyone I know with a kid is always like, I don't know. I guess it's time. <laughs> I, have, I, I, well, that's when you I ask, cried, and now I have a child. And that's when you ask people parenting advice, and they're like, um, when did you know you were ready? And they're like, oh, well, you're never really ready. <laughs> because everyone was a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> you're never really ready. They really were. Well, yeah, everyone was just a mistake. It's an accident. A mistake to a degree, yeah, but yeah. there is math involved. It's very basic math that adds up to a child. Sure. So, it can be a surprise, but then it's like, well, we did do the equation. 
we did the multiplication yeah. tables, and yeah, one penis <laughs> times one vagina equals another human being. Yeah, yeah, that's the math. But sometimes you know, not everyone's good at math. I'm just trying to you and in there with three <laughs> with three kids. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> um. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense. So See, there, I told you I was bad at ending stuff. Well, is there is there anything for clearly people that listen this far into it are committed? They appreciate learning. They're enjoying us and our rapport, but they also they're committed to bettering themselves and their personal endeavors. So, yeah. is there anything in closing that, and maybe moving forward, you could start to kind of bookend? your episodes with something people can take away so they listen to all of the uh, in between oh, the beginning just, and the end you made it sound so enjoyable all the uh, oh god <laughs> yeah the, if you don't listen to the whole thing basically you've missed out on the secrets of life because every conversation I believe has a secret of life in it Ooh. do you want to know what it is I do I, I truly believe that So, every conversation is a relationship. And we talk about this, I mean, with comedy, it's a relationship. I'm always receiving, no matter what. Like, I receive without even trying. My body is a receptor, right? But I have to also be willing to give as much as I receive if I want to have something happen, if I want to have that relationship work cohesively. So in any conversation lies the secret to a successful life. If you give more than you receive, you will never not have enough. Because you you can't not receive. Like think about it like this, if I'm not making sense yet. If I were to walk outside on a sunny day, okay? If I were to walk outside on a sunny day, I would get vitamin D from the sun. Why? Because my body is receptive towards sunlight. I would also get a little darker in pigment. <clears throat> Did I do anything? Did I do anything to make that happen? You went no. outside. But I'm able to give energy now, more energy because of the energy I took in from the sun. Mm. But I can't, there's a limit to it, right? If I don't give the energy away, I can't take in more. Does that make sense? It's like breathing. Another, <laughs> another analogy, it's like breathing. If I don't, if I hold this breath, if I hold in a breath and I don't let it out, I can never take in another breath. So you gotta let that hot breath out. You have to let the hot breath out to breathe back in again. And the deeper I breathe out, the deeper I can breathe in. Well, how do you that makes sense. give... Yes, you are terrible at closing your own show. But the how do you give... I was like, let's close on something, and you're like going down this wormhole of <laughs> analogies. But let, let me say, you, you always... So what I've heard, I, I liked your premise of in every conversation there's a secret to life. Yes. And you're saying you you give more than you receive. How do you give in a conversation without dominating the conversation? So like a good conversation is you let the other person talk and you just absorb their information and their insights. How do you give while receiving or listening? Well, that's it, right? You're giving space. Um, There we go. That's it. You're giving space. There we go. Yeah. A great analogy, just to the point. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. So you. It's better as a collaborator. You're giving your time. You're giving your attention. Yeah. You're giving your focus. Yeah. Your energy. Your intention. Because I'm giving what the other person wants. Attention. They want attention. They want to be understood. I can't understand somebody if I just talk the whole time. Exactly. Right. But also, if the other person asks me a question to glean something then give whatever I have without fear of um, showing too much like be vulnerable 
Because I feel like that is where we connect as human beings. Like when we're vulnerable, when I talk about being an alcoholic and suffering as a kid and all this kind of stuff, mm-hmm. people are like, me too. I did too. And now, boom, I just built a bridge with a person that wasn't there before. And that's in every conversation. What The willingness I have to uh, become open and vulnerable is the the secret to like making that relationship work. Mm. You know, because we grow in the valleys. We don't grow on the mountaintop. What I have found is like the lower the lows, the higher the highs. Yeah. So I look at it like a trampoline. That's right. Where you, you bounce really low and then it yeah. shoots you up even higher. Absolutely. That's right. So take that with you, listeners and viewers. And remember, there's never... Wait. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> He's like, I'm, Let's just, I'm bad at closing my own show. I'm like, well, let me try to close this then. And Joel, like, I, okay, I'll do it. Joel, Byers. <laughs> I cannot thank you much. Uh, can I cannot thank you enough. <laughs> I'm a great public speaker. I cannot thank you enough for coming on the Uniweb interview show. It's been a pleasure um, to get to speak with you. Mm. Your comedy, your class, your podcast, your book. All in the name of helping another and bringing joy to those around you. Yeah, it's my mission. Making comedy accessible. Making comedy for everyone. So, if you're interested in the podcast like we've talked about on here, Hot Breath Podcast is the website. It's on iTunes and YouTube and Spotify and all that, but if we'll you go to the it. website, we'll, we'll link it. Yeah, we'll link it in the... We'll link it in the show notes? We'll link it in my kneecaps. <laughs> 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 But you can even go on the website and there's a search feature where you can just search for any topic on comedy you want. And it'll bring up all the interviews about that. Or if there's a specific comic. There's also ways for you to um, have a blog on there as well. But if you, there's ways for you to support the podcast and get cool merch and things. Uh, if you're interested more about me personally and where I'll be performing. Or I also write my own comedy blog as well all about comedy education and different tips. Uh, joelbyerscomedy.com is the website and on there there's also a link to not only the blog but also my calendar a contact place for you to be able to reach out to me personally and book me or just ask questions I love connecting so reach out to me on my website or on my social media is joelbyerscomedy and at hot breath pod long story short just support people doing positive things like Matt is doing here like I am doing here that is so very humble but thank you for <laughs> listening thank you for hanging out with us here I, I feel like we went up and down and all around but at the end of the day it comes down to just doing the work yeah and helping people and just staying consistent and I appreciate you consistently listening to this entire episode yeah thank you but I do teach comedy classes, <laughs> comedy workshops, all the above. Anything comedy related, joelbyerscomedy.com. There's a page on there to see all the different services I offer and just how I can help out and um, empower people with comedy. You're a good person, Joel. I appreciate that, Matt. You're, you're a good person. You're Thanks for person. giving your platform and your audience. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to connect with them. Well, nobody else would come on, so... <laughs> I've interviewed everyone else in the world. <laughs> I've got a quote of me. <laughs> this guy. Dude. It's been great, man. Like, yeah. <laughs> he's, still, he's still like trying to end it. It's been great. Um, should you say your website again? <laughs> All right.